Thank you. Go ahead, Mylin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jesse, do the roll call, please. Will do. Um, Mr. Middleman, Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction. Present. Mrs. Manzi, Assistant Superintendent for Special Education. Present. Mr. Kola Hafar, Assistant Superintendent for Administration and Personnel. Present. Ms. Villarreal, Assistant Superintendent for Business and Operations. Present. Dr. Linda Adams, Superintendent of Schools. Present. Ms. Augulis, Ms. Augulis, Board President. Present. Ms. Panago, Board Vice President. Oh, that's me. <laughs> Present. And Mrs. Napolitano Ferno, Board Trustee. Present. Mr. Washaw, Board Trustee. How you doing? <laughs> Ms. Kennedy, Board Trustee. Present. And Ms. Hutchinson, Board Council. Present. Thank you. And then myself, Jesse Kempis, District Clerk. Okay, thank you so much. Um, before we go into the later part of our meeting, um, I just wanted to just say a few words um, in regard to our last meeting, um, the John Pearl conversation. Um, at our previous meeting, there was a discussion of closing John Pearl Elementary. Since the meeting, the Board of Education has read your emails <clears throat> and many of senior responses and concerns on social media. To close a school, there are procedures, policy, and state education law that was referenced in policy. This will take a minimum of six months in gathering the proper information and input from various entities. In September, providing what restrictions are in place, such as social distancing and what methods can be used for large gathering, the Board of Education can approve a committee to include all stakeholders. The committee will review the data professional analysis, community input to include Board of Education and administrators. The process will be transparent and provide everyone the opportunity to share the concerns and review data and input from the committee. We appreciate your concerns and questions and we will be diligent in the process as we know this is a very important matter. Thank you. Uh, Jesse, was there any changes to the meeting? There was um, one change uh, since the meeting was posted, which was just an additional item under new discussion items. Is that listed? Would that be listed number three? Yes, it is. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I need a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the April 16th, 2020 Board of Education meeting. Make a motion by Lee. Mylon will second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, I can't even see the minutes. I can't get online to see the minutes. I got all eyes but you, Eileen. I said I can't get online to see the minutes, so I'm going to abstain because I, I thought there was something in there that I needed to question, and now I can't get on to see it. Okay, so one, one abstain, one abstention. Yes, but I'd like to revisit that if there is something that needs to be changed to make sure that the minutes are proper. Absolutely. Okay, I, it might be at the next meeting. I can't see it right now, so I'm sorry. No problem. Okay, uh, we're moving on to policy procedures. Uh, we have a approval for the second reading of the new policy 6715, Uniform Guidance Compliance for Federal Awards. Okay, making a motion. What are we doing? Uh, yes, I'm just trying to think this. Uh, oh. Anybody can remind me again what this policy was? You know, that was, um, Linda, you, you can speak better to this because that came from you guys, right? It actually or, came or legal. Policy. I'm not really so sure what that came from. It's a legal policy that you need in order to purchase things. So Lisa can explain it just. Oh, right. Me. Right. And I read it over. I, I, was, I had no problem with it. And I, I believe Mark read it over as well. Yeah, all school districts are required to have that policy in order to be eligible. Right. Right. We actually sent it to you, Lisa, for a legal review first. That's correct. So we were okay. that it's consistent with the um, templates provided by the policy services and it's consistent with the law. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. So I need a motion and a second. Motion, motion by Eileen. Second by Lee. All in favor? Aye. Aye by Aye. Lee. Aye by Eileen. 
Aye. 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 Aye, Mylan. I think we have an all. I heard all voices. Yeah. Okay, all yeah. members said yes. Okay, we're moving on to new discussion items. Uh, the first item is the mental health initiatives. Uh, Gail Santos, are you available to have your presentation? Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Gail. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Can you see? I'm I'm sharing a slide. Can you see my PowerPoint? I'm yes. on the phone, so no, Gail, I can't. I'm sorry. If you could email them to me, though, that would be great. I'd be happy to and do so. Absolutely. I can't get online right now to see them, but I'll see them afterwards. I'll be sure to send you a copy. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the invitation. It is with both pleasure and pride that I review the mental health initiatives for 2020-2021. I'm going to move the screen, obviously, as I speak, calling your attention to the first of four targeted programs. And if I may, we'll speak to the ruler program last because that is the newest program being introduced introduced to you that in part encompasses some of these other target areas. So we'll start with number two, at-risk assessments. If you, you make me talk Earlier this year, I introduced to you or reviewed the results of the box <laughs> latest survey district-wide. And from there, it, it identified some risk indicators and some behaviors and um, tendencies of substance abuse and risky behaviors that we wanted to further target and identify. And as such, one of our recommendations was to develop an assessment to provide to various grades, not every grade, but various grades in elementary, middle school, and early high school as a preventative measure to identify anyone who's potentially at risk. The whole theme of this presentation and shift is to focus solely on enhanced prevention rather than reactionary and intervention programs, more of a prevention model. So the at-risk assessments would be gleaned. We've already um, uh, collected some samples. It will be in a collaborative effort. I'm hoping <coughs> as well, that we can identify those students that are potential risks. Um, additionally, su suicide prevention, as you know, we have broached that over the years and that continues to um, be a focus of the department, especially as there has been more strife and emergencies and students refer to hospitals, unfortunately, as well as um, emergency assessment centers such as DAS that I brought into the YFS department and the other mental health units for that matter this year. Um, but the underpinning of that is emotional regulation. If we can teach students um, and any person for that matter to understand and manage their emotions, then they would be less at risk. So that is where the RULA program is going to take us. And we'll speak to that in one moment. Lastly, parenting workshops. As you know, we have been providing parenting workshops in the evening and also during the school day very well attended, but I think we would have a higher attendance if we had um, offered, we continue to offer them in the evening as well as many parents work. We focused on the middle school areas, um, both North and South End over the last couple of years, particularly because of the developmental readiness of those children and their transitional years. Uh, now we're proposing to extend it district wide as we see the needs amongst our families. And we've also been asked by parents to offer it in various grades. Okay. So now I shall bring to your attention the primary topic of this evening's presentation, and that is the ruler program. And one would ask, why are we looking at the ruler program? What is it? Firstly, it's an evidence-based program um, that is socially and emotionally, it's a social emotional learning program, excuse me, that is from Yale University. It, its premise is that of emotional intelligence and systems theories. And before I define what that is, it's also accredited by the CASEL organization. That is the collaborative academic social and emotional learning in the state that as you see, I have listed there the five competencies or tenants of the principles, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. The premise here is that if a child or an adult for that matter has, can manage one's behavior, then they can impact the behavior or the exchange 
in a situation or with another person. Now, emotional intelligence, one might say, what is emotional intelligence? It's the ability to understand and manage one's own emotions as well as those emotions of those around you. So I ask each of us or anyone that's listening to this presentation, try to reflect personally. Have you ever been in a dynamic, whether it be with social media, whether it be with a spouse, another friend, family member, child, and that you either, base, uh, in response to something that was said to you, replied in a manner in which you did not anticipate that emotional reaction, or conversely, did someone ever say something to you that you misunderstood or didn't agree with your emotional reaction and it caused a negative outcome? That's the premise of this program. And I would think everyone would say absolutely because that's the nature of being human with thoughts and feelings. So what we're doing here is trying to teach the management skills and give our staff and students, not just, um, not just students, the skill set and strategies to manage one's social behavior, or emotional behavior. And what is the benefit of doing that? Research shows that it has marked benefits, marked positive outcomes across the school community and outside the school community. So let's look at that further. How is it relevant? Oh, excuse me, and I forgot, I'm sorry. Systems theory. It's also based, going back, ruler program is also based in systems theory. And many of you may remember or understand, and if not, Peter Senge said the systems theory is the understanding of how the different elements in the whole interact with each other. What's the connection, the connectedness? Each element within, within a system has different beliefs, different values, but at the end, they must act as a whole. Secondly, as far as personal behavior or emotions, it's the connection in any situation and then the better understanding of how and what someone did or some way you influence that outcome by a behavior or an emotion. So it's a, the semblance of connectedness and how the parts need to work as a whole for a healthier environment. So now let's ask, what is the relevance? Why emotional intelligence? Well, let me tell you the founder of the Yale Center for U, uh, Emotional Intelligence at Yale University, founder and director, I should say, is Dr. Mark Brackett. He is very engaging. He is highly regarded and um, very esteemed in this field of study. And he has um, based his studies and he is the creator and founder of the Ruler Program because he said that emotion systems, everyone's emotion system is inextricably connected to their cognitive system. What does that mean? Every thought, every feeling, every relationship and every activity has an emotional component to it. That's true of children, students, children in your home, adults, teachers, all of us. So our emotions have a direct impact on our cognitive system. And that equates to learning. Research shows that emotions influence attention, memory, and learning, decision-making, creativity, mental and physical well-being, ability to form and maintain healthy relationships, and academic and workplace performance. Now note, those are very global, but it's the essence and very holistic approach of, of um, whole wellness and environmental wellness. So I ask you now, has our school system experienced stress in this new adaptation to our new normal as a result of the um, current pandemic? Have families at home, and these are really rhetorical questions, have families, personal families felt stress as a result of the new learning situation and the new teaching situation as a result of the pandemic? All of these stressors impact your mental and physical well-being. The impact of ruler studies have showed is that it fosters a range of behaviors that shifts the school climate that are of course essential to positive health development. So you're looking at the climate and we've been looking at holistic approaches for years in that we want to garner and to reinforce a feeling of safety a feeling of groundedness, a, fear, a feeling of connectedness, 
and shared relationships. You do that by having an understanding of what it is you're feeling, what emotions you're experiencing, how to best manage them, because rule of program, will, the aim is to have your best self. And in doing so, you impact the building as a whole. Similarly, not only the building is improved because of the skills that are honed in and positively impacted, such as attention skills, et cetera. There was a 10% increase in academic performance. And then another study showed there was 12% improvement in classroom climate. Because the premise is, is that everyone is speaking the same language. There's an understanding and exchange about the emotion and the incident that's transpiring. Rather than being reactionary, we're going to teach children and adults as well to be more reflective and then to strategically react to a situation rather than emotionally respond. What are other positive outcomes um, from the ruler studies that have been done? There is, of course, a development of emotional skills, fewer attention and learning problems, and then greater social and leadership skills. And one would say, well, why is this significant? Well, because the underpinning of this is that the development of emotional skills, fewer attention and learning problems, greater social and leadership, leadership skills are not specific just to students. It also impacts the adults, any person in the community, any person in the schoolhouse. So our aim is to model and then teach in modeling. And I might add, this not, is not a top-down decision or top-down um, directive in so far as this is a practice that teachers do every day in relating to their children. What is just being honed in is the understanding of their own emotions perhaps, perhaps because we are all women and it is very challenging to teach. Um, it, it, in my opinion, humbly, uh, it, it requires a certain personality, a skill set to relate to so many different personalities and make, making every person feel special in that setting what, while you're going through your own personal di dilemma. It takes a very disciplined person to leave the separate and personal life outside the door and then maintain a certain de delivery and disposition to positively influence students. Well, that is question therein, though, is that we are presented with many different challenges with our students in school. And are all teachers familiar with what emotions and feelings and behaviors the, the students are demonstrating? Do the students understand why, if they are acting out, what are the underpinnings beh um, behind that action? Okay, and in doing so, it will impact the school and the classroom singularly, and the, the school as a whole. So how are we going to do that? As I said, it's not going to be a top-down mentality. It's going to be modeled. And the best way to do that is that we're going to use our own staff and start with the adults and ask of nine buildings, we're going to hold off introducing this to the high school until the second year. First year, it's K through eight, seven elementary schools, two middle schools, one administrator, a social worker, and then a, the option of a third teacher. It could be a mental health professional. It could be a health teacher. We're, I'm relying on the building administrator to know their culture and climate best and to identify the person that would um, relate well, um, wants to participate, and then also volunteers to turnkey and bring this forward throughout the year because this isn't a one-time lesson. The program is taught online over the summer. It's only a six week program, it's two hours per week. So it is doable even if we're on modified shifts. And it's a two year training program in that you first learn the emotions, you first learn the distinction of feelings, and then I'll show you the other parts of the program on the next slide. And that is the initial element, but then it's brought to the schoolhouse and it's introduced to the staff and the adults first. And then that staff and adult group in their faculty meeting establishes the norms and values that they want to aspire to and teach the children to attain, okay? And throughout the year, the Yale University will be providing counseling, will be providing implementation strategies and materials to help each respective building roll out the program as they deem suitable for their um, particular climate. 
So what, so, so that's the behind. And I might add, just so that you know, ladies and gentlemen, the monies um, requested to be transferred tonight are from this year's funds, but we did receive approval from the auditor because it is a requirement of Yale University to, even though the application is being submitted now, if approved, for summer training, it is a condition of the application that we secure that position. So the auditors reviewed the application. I went through Joanne Sharrett, and the director of purchasing, and received approval. So these monies are already allocated. Okay, so now what does the ruler program look like? As we said, we're going to target, of course, adults and teachers first for the modeling and the introduction. And the mindset they're going to be introduced to is emotion matters uh, mindset. Again, looking at each situation, not as a behavior, but as a feeling and emotion. And then really the antecedent, what is the cause? Why is the child feeling that way? But also before looking at the child, we are going to ask them to live the work. And any of you go on the Yale University um, website, there are very short videos that there are comments from many educators across the country. There are many school districts on Long Island that are already implementing this program. Uh, just as a sidebar, the YFS, and I also had a subcommittee, we've investigated at least five other programs. We have attended professional conferences and we have con conferred with other districts that have implemented Ruler. We did have a planning to visit the sites this year, but of course the school closed, but I assure you we have enough professional background and knowledge to know this is the, the program that is most suitable for our district and is the most effective. Um, and that's why we're pr proposing it this evening. Now the target, you can see, I don't have to read every every objective, but you can see ruler is, the word is representative of the target um, words taught to children as far as recognizing, understanding, labeling, expressing, and regulating emotions. That is a series of, series of um, lessons and a series of strategies and a series of um, charts and interactive play. So when I say lesson, this is not going to be a binder with 30 lessons. It's instead more chart-like. If you can think of a tic-tac-toe board and it's divided, well, let's try that again. Let's do, think of a square in four diff, cut in four equal parts. One is green, one is yellow, one is blue, one is red. What we teach all students, and interestingly enough, adults and students learn the same strategies because it's applicable to all. What they do is they are asked to identify their feeling, identify their emotion, assess it where it is on the meter. And the children literally put something in that color section that represents where they are in their emotional level. So it's a tr that's the interaction that I'm speaking of. So we'll look a little more closely at that. This, these are the anchor tools and the mood meter is the little square that I just discussed with you that has the four distinctive colors that represent level of intensity. So without belaboring and reading every word, you can see the highlight, and this is not done in one meeting, this is done over the course of the year. The charter, the charter emphasis is the entire culture of the school. After the training team presents or attends the 12 hour session in the summer and then continues with the webinar contact and the counseling contact and receiving the implementation materials, brings it back to the faculty, has a conversation and then has collaborative conversation, gaining consensus as what is the value of the school? What will the norms and what will the goals be? So each school may be different, but they're all moving in the, the path of um, emotional regulation for a more positive outcome, obviously. So that's the charter discussion. That's the climate as a whole. The mood meter is the individual reflection that both students and, and children use. And then there's the meta meter, and that is emotional situations with strategies to promote the best self. And that those strategies also then take a step away from the self and, and enter the world of relationships. And then lastly, the blueprint is, you've heard the word of like empathy and conflict resolution because that has been part of character education. But the reflective component is new in that for every action, there is a reaction and for every decision, there should be thought as to what is the best path. 
and the logic or philosophy or tenant of this program is with emotional management and under understanding of why, then the child or and or the adult can then choose what the appropriate response would be as opposed to reactionary. So ladies and gentlemen, one would say, why are we doing this now? And I, I, I had spoken to the administration um, earlier today with Dr. Adams meeting. And although the word serendipitous may not be appropriate as we're going through such a critical time, uh, if we look at society and, and all of the conflict and the, the abrupt changes imposed on people because it was not by choice. Um, I use the word serendipitous because this is an essential prevention because our students and our families and our adults and the community at large, the risk factors are increasing. Okay, we have pr protective factors for a healthier life. And what is a protective factor? Your family, your loved ones, where you garner support, right? Your religious beliefs, your friends, your community contacts, risk factors or anything that impedes that. So it could be on a personal level, loss of money, loss of a job, loss of health, right? Uh, disruption to the family unit, disruption of your day-to-day -day lifestyle. Okay, the imposition of potentially one feeling isolated and the social distancing. So the point is that for every risk factor, all risk factors generate more risk factors. And as risk factors increase, your protective factors are reduced, which ultimately compromise student and family resiliency and ability to learn. So I can make that more practical by describing or discussing just what we're going through today. We're all responding to a pandemic, right? And the, the first consequence for every incident, there's a reaction or a consequence as far as risk factors are concerned. And in the pandemic, of course, the natural consequences worry for one's health and well being. But from the pandemic, in addition to the health crisis and the concern for your loved ones and your own well being and your babies and our, and our elders. Um, and people that are compromised because we're all not even responding in the same manner because people are in different levels of risk, then the schools were closed. And what's the ramification of the schools? There's a consequence there potentially. Although we're thinking out of the box and we're trying to meet the needs of our students and families in a most, a most expeditious way, excuse me, no. Um, the, the burden though, it can be a burden. If you look at the commercials on television right now, there, there are families saying help, we respect teachers so much because it's such so arduous. Parents are being asked to assume the responsibilities of teachers who have many years of experience, have a skill set and an understanding of how to work with their children. Secondly, are they comfortable in that um, teaching modality? Are the students comfortable in that teaching modality? If you have a little one who has attentional problems in school, and I, when I was a classroom teacher, I had two young children and I dreaded doing homework because my classroom students would sit up and sit and be studious and follow direction. At home, my daughter would roll off the dining room table, under the dining room table and slide off the, the, the chair as if she were a slinky because mommy was different than teacher. And, and parents are probably experiencing that same situation, imposing more stress within the family. Where is the child developmentally? Adolescent children, just by nature, are more combative or a little more challenging, not because um, they're ornery, it's because they're trying to establish, they're in conflict, they're trying to establish a level of independence. So now if you, if the parent and adolescent does not have a good working relationship, to sit down and to be expected to cover the curriculum and ensure that the child is staying up to speed can impose stress. So I think you understand where I'm going. The stress of the distance learning can create conflict within the family. The stress or the, the challenge between parent and child extends to the family. So this pandemic, even though it started in the realm of health, has impacted all areas of our society and students, families, and communities are feeling the same. So that's the proof of risk factors increase, your protective factors decrease, and those children, trust me, are not as ready to learn as when they feel secure with the protective factor. So the ruler program, simply put, is going to help students and staff 
manage emotions, teach them strategies to review their feelings before they react. So there's not just a cause and effect relationship. And, and studies will show, and many studies, and I can produce that, that there is an impact and a positive outcome to behavior, to feelings, to climate, and not just for students, for all community members. And what I neglected to add in the second year, or excuse me, once we're embedded the rollout in the school, I'm neglecting to include the families. We would of course bring the families in to the cultural goal of each building so that any trends and any strategies and any learning skills that are taught in the schoolhouse transfer back to the home. So this has the potential of positively impacting our community at a large, and I think it's the optimal time to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, thank you Gail, and thank you for taking the time a week ago to actually sit down and go over all of this with me. I appreciate it. And I appreciate all that you're doing in light of this pandemic for when the kids come back. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. I have a, I have a question, Gail. Yes, ma'am. All these kids that are coming back, there's a percentage of them that have not taken to the way we're teaching. Yes. For many, a multitude of reasons. Mm -hmm. What do we do in case of, you know, next year and they're in third grade mm -hmm. and they don't know part of their second grade curriculum right. for many reasons? Mm -hmm. What is it that's in place, if anything, that they're going to do in third grade to bring them up to par to get them ready for continuation of education? <clears throat> well, there, that's a two part answer in so far as we look at the child holistically. So right now, I'm looking at the, oh, the whole wellness of the child. We want to make sure that they're engaged. And if they're not engaged, I have to give credit to nurses, social workers, my uh, staff here. We've called every at-risk family that we know of, the homeless families. We've had people come from Forest Hills, that because they're allowed to be 50 miles away from district, to pick up laptops the social workers, the nurses, as I know the special ed department as well, is reaching out to all students to ensure that they are A, staying in contact with the school, especially those that are at risk. There's a relationship between the parent and the provider and the, the providers are speaking directly to the children. So that's as much as that we can do right now during the, during the separation um, uh, constraints. In September, let's assume and hope that we resume school in September as close to normal, quote unquote, as, as the law and the um, situation allows. I think the benefit of, of course, the counseling is going to be there's, I am meeting, let me say this, I'm meeting with the nurses and the social workers, and we are de currently developing a transitional plan and trying to anticipate how, what, how children will present when they return from such an uh, abrupt situation. I'm hearing from the, psych, uh, the social workers that students were managing well with the counseling. And I have to tell you because there was a small glimmer of hope of returning to school. Now, and some of the younger children are loving time home with the family and mom and dad and everyone's together. So you have variable reactions. The, the secondary students, however, I think, and for, for reasons we all understand, they're, they're going through their, um, their rites of passage and they're losing some of their, their, uh, their rites of passage activities, such as the prom, et cetera, because of these limitations. They had that glimmer of hope and once they were told that they're not returning before June, now that hope has been diminished. Those are the children that we're reaching out to right now. The assessment tool that I'm speaking of will assist us in identifying which students are struggling emotionally, okay? Not academically, Lee, I do, I, I do hear your point, but the first thing we need to do is, is anyone at crisis who's at risk, who is su successfully transitioning, transitioning back to the school setting and who is having an awkward transition? Um, and that- this question? Yes. Uh, you know, educationally and emotionally sort of tie up in, in certain times. 100 
you're educationally behind, mm -hmm. say in second grade or in seventh grade, mm -hmm. you're not feeling emotionally secure. Yes. So isn't it a, a dual uh, issue here? 100%. The, the program that I'm proposing, it is holistic in that it is stemming from the child and the adult's decision making based on their knowledge of strategies and understanding of their own emotion. If you're asking me if someone feels delayed in their academic stu study, does that impose anxiety or stress? Absolutely. So I'm sure as a collective unit, we're going to look at any remedies or um, compensatory support if that is warranted, but it's hard to project what we will do in September until we know what September will look like, whether we're going to resume a normal schedule or we're going to do a um, resume a part-time schedule. So that I know the superintendent plans, uh, we, we, we will be looking at that more in depth. There is definitively a relationship between learning and emotions and behavior and mental health. But right now I'm targeting the holistic uh, approach in so far as mental health and environment. But you do raise a very good point and at least the assessment as far as mental health issues and behavioral concerns and stressors will be identified. But we will, as far as the mental health, we will make ourselves available to parents, we will make ourselves available to staff, and we will have, I'm sure, heightened referrals. But I also think there is a resiliency and a, a um, welcoming of returning to school. And very often the students are more, re more resilient than adults. I'm not being glib, but I've been in the field a long time and I think we can, we can speak to that. Sometimes change is harder. Um, so I think there it may be a positive, a welcomed return as well. So it will have to be done on a case by case basis, but it, it should be investigated and it should be responded to if anyone is severely re um, uh, behind. There are interventions already in place that we can tap upon. Uh, and there, there are venues that we speak and we collaborate as, as professionals and those that know the children best, such as IST meetings, as um, CSEs, as team meetings, as dialogue with principal and teacher, but your point does not go unnoticed. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there any other questions from the board? Yes, I have a question. Gail, you mentioned that that money has already been in the, it's already in the budget for this year. For the it, summer program? Yes, I yes, because the app because Yale University requires a commitment within four weeks of the application being accepted, I have to and I want to secure the July training. It starts mid-July. Um, I sent all those papers to the director of purchasing. She spoke to the auditors and received uh, approval to move forward. Okay, so you're asking for money for next year's budget, the budget that we're working on now. Is that what you're saying? No, madam. I just no. want to clarify. No, no, no. So this year's okay. budget, because so let's say the money's now for in June or May. I'm right. transferring amongst my codes so it can all go into contractual to go towards this ah. program. So it's okay. not to burden the July onward budget. That's what I was saying. Oh, okay. So oh, so that's, that does clarify it. So it's already, you're using the money from the budget that was approved last year and we're still spending. Which is not typical, but I did have to say. No, it's not, but we're not in typical times. That, so, it's also a requirement of the training and the auditor reviewed it and approved it. Okay, so that's for this first year. And then you, you mentioned the second year. No, it's um, a two-year like, program. That commitment is for a two-year program. Oh, okay. So you're not going to come back next year and ask us to put more money in the budget? No, no, I, I oh, will. Okay. The, 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 only, the only additional cost there will be that I do not have factored now is that the night there would be two teachers times nine buildings, that's 18 teachers that would need to be compensated for 12 hours of tutorials over the summer. Right, okay. All right, that sounds good. Thank you, Gail. You're welcome. So I don't know if you want me to address, I know Lee brought up the question regarding um, gaps with students' education and, and being prepared for that next grade level. Yes, I do. I like, I like your input. So we have been meeting um, regularly with our administrative staff and they have been in communication with our teaching staff as well. Uh, we put together um, you know, several, we're looking to put together several committees of, uh, of our teachers and administrators to identify what those skills and gaps are 
going to be. Um, and we want to get the frontline people to really, you know, give us that input. And that's our instructional staff. Um, and Gail is correct. You know, the, the social and emotional aspect of our students' life is critical to their success academically. And that's something that we are putting into place and, and considering when we're making any of our adjustments as we're going forward. The goal of the committee is to identify those gaps in skill development for children. Um, we want to try to look at, um, you know, focus primarily on reading and mathematics um, because we want to maintain our children's progress going forward. Um, and with the goal of creating some sort of um, activity that students can do uh, over the summer um, to, to either keep them at the level that they're at or um, you know, have them be able to move a little bit forward. Um, we do have a couple things that we're looking at, um, but this is in the initial stages um, with uh, administrators and uh, you know, getting that teacher committee together. The other piece that we're looking at is to our curriculum areas, uh, what skills that we need to spiral into, um, this, into our September curriculum and October curriculum um, to make sure that we are filling those gaps that we have identified. Um, you know, we're looking to see if we can find some sort of assessment for our students to see where they are and give that data and information to our teachers um, as they move into that next school year. Um, you know, I think technology is a big area that we need to look at. Um, you know, we're in the process of um, putting our technology committee together. Um, we think it's, it's critical that devices are something that everyone has access to. Um, not just devices, but everybody should have the same device. And that goes from our teaching staff, you know, through our K-12 population of students. So it's something that we're planning on right now. Um, and hopefully, you know, by September, um, we should be able to, uh, you know, start to initiate our one-to-one -one, um, rollout of technology for our students. Okay, I have a, I have a question. You know, you do an assessment, we'll just say uh, child Mary, second grader should know certain types of math, should know certain, uh, should be able to read to a certain level. And she can't. And then Susie could do a little better. And then Frank might be worse than the two of them. How does that third grade teacher handle all this? When, you know, how is she going to bring all these children up to date? I mean, how long might it take? I mean, is anyone looking to this? Will you be working on this? Or yeah, it's something that we are definitely looking at. Um, it, it is going to be a challenge for our instructional staff, and it is something that we want to continue to provide support for them. Um, again, you know, having that good core instruction in the classroom is something we've worked on over the past six years uh, in both literacy and mathematics. I'm comfortable with the progress that the district has made in those areas, um, but we are going to continue to look at other supports that students will need, um, whether it be additional math support or additional reading support um, outside of the traditional classroom sometimes. Um, and that's something that we're, we're continuing to investigate. You know, one of the opportunities we currently have is a program called eSpark. It's an adaptive program. So it meets the child where they are and um, either below grade level, at grade level or above grade level. Um, so it is something that we're going to investigate further as a, a resource for our students and our parents, as well as our staff as we move um, throughout the remainder of this school year into the summer and then into September. Who are you speaking to? I don't even know who I'm talking to. Who is this? I'm talking that was, to that was Dean. That was Dean. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, Dean. Uh, so... <clears throat> So, Dean, one of the things that you had mentioned was the one-on-one -on -one device. And if you recall, I'd say maybe two, probably three years ago, I advocated for the one-on-one -on -one devices. So it's um, I'm glad to see that even under these circumstances, that we'll be able to provide the one-on-one -on -one devices for our children. Yeah, so I'll speak a little bit about that. Um, you know, I think there are opportunities, um, you know, in any any situation that happens, and, and this provides us that opportunity. Um, at the point when we first discussed the one-to-one -one initiative, um, you know, we didn't really have a learning management program that we were subscribing to. Uh, it wasn't something that was widely used across the district. Um, but 
due to this you know, extended closure, we now have a, a larger population of our teachers using um, a, a several different learning management um, platforms. Um, so that's kind of opportunity for us to be able to now give devices because um, the type of instruction that'll take place in the classroom, um, the goal is to have it seamless if, if there are any extended closures, closures moving forward. So we are looking to get the same device for all of our students, um, as well as our faculty. I think that's really critical. Um, I think everybody needs to be on the same um, platform that we are moving forward with. And, uh, and that's something we're working with our staff. Um, the funding for that, um, we're hopefully going to access some of our smart schools funding, uh, which we still have uh, some funding available to us. And, and so it should be at no additional cost to the district. Initially, that's where I thought we should have taken the money from. And, and we have, um, we have, you know, our, you know, we currently have about 1700 Chromebooks in district. Um, we have given out and distributed over 1100 to our families and students um, during this time. Uh, and I, you know, that's, that was our initial funding source for the Chromebooks. Uh, and we'll continue to use that as a, as a way to leverage um, more devices for our students. Thank you. I appreciate your response to that. Does any of the board, question, uh, board members have any questions? Nope, I'm good. Mark? Mark? I'm good. Uh, Jackie? I'm good. And Lee? Well, who's going to do this over the summer? I'm sorry, are you speaking to me? The I'm elephant. speaking to, I guess it would be Dean. Who will be taking this over in the summertime? These responsibilities that you would now have. The I, dean I, question. I don't have a. I don't have an answer for that. I'm sorry, but we, you know, our hope is that we have a, a solid plan in place um, for the remainder of this school year that will bring us into September. And who's going to oversee that? What what administrators can oversee that if you're gone? I don't mean to put you on a spot, but I care about our district, so I need to know the answers. Yes, you because do I, need to put them on the spot, Lee. So how is this going to be monitored if there is no one in your position? Uh, we, you Isn't know, that I, something that Linda needs to answer now? Okay, Linda, answer that question. So we have to sit um, as an administrative cabinet and see how some of these responsibilities will fall on other administrators. Excuse um, me, what, what other administrators will be left? Well, um, didn't we just have it where we had administrators I, out? And I'm asking a question. So this is not a we debate. Have Lee, Lee I'm, I'm answering though. Lee, you're, you're well, doing this. We have campaigning. No, I'm asking a question because I want an answer. So you're campaigning is what you're doing. No, I'm not. And it's still, we still moved forward. We still were able to move forward. We're going to move forward. We are a strong district. We're going to move forward. I'm I have faith in the Dr. people that Adam, are here. I'm asking Dr. Adams. I don't mean to put anyone on the spot, but there are a lot of kids at risk, especially now. Especially now. A lot of kids, not just one or two or 10 or some emotional problems. We have a lot of kids at risk. A lot of kids do not know how to read when they should we be know reading. There's a lot of kids a at lot, risk. Not, we have, the, we have teachers calling us to tell us Lee, that there's Lee, suicidal have, kids and we have to find administrators. I'm asking a question, just like you would Lee, ask a question. I know. I, I got phone calls from- I don't need an answer from you. I need an answer from administration. I'm just saying to you, do you understand that I went a week and a half ago and had a sit down meeting about children at risk, mental health and threat assessment and so risk. Thinking? With, with Ms. Santos, you were welcome to come. I didn't see you want to be there. I was there. You're bringing it up now, but you could have went to the meeting. You could have had a meeting with her and you could have gotten to know what is out there and what initiatives we're going to try to bring in for the new school year to help these kids. Emotionally, I'm talking about educationally. 
how are we going to bring these students from plan A to plan B or plan C or plan D? Because not everyone learns the same. That's all I'm asking. I think, I think we should have faith in our teachers. Don't you, Lee? I think our teachers are wonderful. But we also have a team working to help our teachers become the best they can be. Well, you do realize also this is a national pandemic. It's not just in Connecticut. It's everywhere. So every student in every level at every district is going to have some catching up to do in September. There, we don't even know yet what Governor Cuomo is going to do. He could very well say the first couple of weeks, who knows in the, in the new school year, we're gonna do this, this, and this. Who knows if next year there's gonna be state testing because how are you gonna do that? Maybe those weeks they're gonna use to utilize to do what we couldn't do now. You're absolutely right that kids are gonna be behind, but you have to have faith that we have all these extra people in place. We have See. the math specialists. We have the people who come in and will do the reading with them. If there are kids that are being, being falling behind, our admins should be finding out about it and working with these kids. That should be what's being done right now. Phone calls should be going home. They, things should be getting done to check on those at-risk kids. And isn't that just what they said? <clears throat> I do believe we have been addressing at-risk students on a regular basis. Uh, the school psychologists in the buildings in conjunction with the chair people, the special education teachers, the regular education teachers, the instructional support teams in all buildings have been reaching out. We've had a coordinated um, process and in, 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 in putting together uh, ways to communicate with families as well as students to make sure that everyone's well cared for now and to start planning for the future. I would love to highlight the school psychologists and the YFS workers who've been doing phone counseling this entire time, classroom teachers and special education teachers who have also been reaching out to families just to check in with them. I believe we've started this process now and it'll be important to continue this conversation both May and June over the summer and to plan for September. Uh, Lee, are you, are you done, Lee? <clears throat> uh, Linda, I believe Lee was asking you a question. Do you have an answer to her question? So the administrative team needs to get together and parse out um, the, re the responsibilities of the abolished positions. Um, you, you know, we, we did have an absentee um, this year, but that was filled in by another full-time administrator. And then someone filled in that person's administrative role so that we could keep the district moving forward. The oversight of the entire district is going to be diminished. Um, with the, the abolishments of the two district uh, assistant superintendendents. Um, I, I, I really, I, I can't candy coat Linda, that. Linda, weren't the, but, but a lot of these you spoke about. A lot of these you spoke about, and now it's, it's, it's almost like everything changes. Everything changes once we have a board meeting. But this was spoken about in the past. If it became a financial hardship, these are positions that we could get rid of. These are positions that we could, we could go to a lower position and other districts have this. This isn't like something that was just pulled out of the sky. Well, actually the assistant superintendent of curriculum instruction has been in the Connecticut school district since the inception. I really don't know of any school districts except really, really small ones on the East end where there's not a district level position in, in, um, uh, curriculum and instruction. There, there, there's generally a district level position in special education as well. And I, I know that the name of the position was changed from assistant to the superintendent to the assistant superintendent, but that also included increased responsibilities. And really when some of these positions were discussed, we said that it's much easier for someone to work down than, than to ask people to work up out of their title because it will potentially include stipends for unit work that has never been in the unit before. So the, this, is, this, this, is, this is not, at the last board meeting, that was the first time that the assistant 
and official instructions position was ever really discussed and it was discussed to abolish the oversight. I, I, rem I recall, I recall having a conversation with you that if the position became vacant, that the director could step up and do the job. What that's, director? That's, what, that's the conversation you and I had. Which director? She was the one telling me, I believe it was the English director. I could be wrong. It was this the one that stepped up already. Right. She was in the, she was in the role. Okay. And did you right. not tell me that? Yes, that she could do the role. I thought she could. Okay. That's what you told me. I'm just going off what you told me. Leo that tells, me, that, that that Lee mean only that I tells me to listen to administration. Lee, I listened to administration. Remember that. But that didn't mean not replacing her role. So I thought that I thought that Mrs. Poppy did a wonderful job stepping in while Mr. Middleman was out, and I thought she might be able to handle the role moving forward. Um, but that was not not replacing her as a curriculum director and having the English department have a curriculum director. I have faith in her ability. She's a wonderful an English director, absolutely, and she did very well as an interim assistant superintendent of curriculum instruction. Those are two very different roles. We had another administrator in her shoes doing the directorship of English to keep that program moving forward as well. The board approved um, Mrs. Pulliam to move into that position and do that work while Mrs. Poppy was substituting for Mr. Middleman. So Linda, do you anticipate with these uh, positions that were abolished, that we could be looking at some potential mm -hmm. litigations. Um, again, uh, as far as unit work, and like you were mentioning before, it's one thing to go up and then to carry down, but it's another to be up. I mean, to be um, to go up and, and add on. <clears throat> uh, I think that there would have to be um, some negotiation for impact bargaining if you ask people to do work that was not originally in their unit. And I would allow, I would really rather have our attorneys answer that question. Gary, can you answer that question? Actually, Gary's not on the call anymore, but yes, oh. there's the possibility of impact bargaining. I think as we stated before, you'd really have to make sure that when you're abolishing positions, um, individuals who, um, that you do it by seniority and then the possibility of uh, individuals challenging um, their position or their title being cut because they may have more seniority and, and than another individual. Certainly, there are lots of things that have to be examined when you make these considerations. Lisa, this vote already went through last meeting. I don't know if you recall. Um, yeah. So that's, I don't think that's the, the issue now. Um, I, I think... Uh, the issue, I think, is the issue is educating I, I'm children. I'm speaking now, Lee. I'm speaking okay, now. I apologize. My turn. I apologize. Thank you. Lisa, I yeah. think, you know, when, when it comes to seniority, um, these were the top level. So I don't think there was anybody with more seniority for that, you know, and that position's gone now. So if you're talking about them stepping up, there is no position to step up to. Well, There's, the, the work has to be di divided, and that's the job of the superintendent. So, right. you know, in her cabinet, that's, she has to handle that. That's her job. And then we Linda pay a lot of money to our superintendent. I think, I think Linda can handle it. I'm good with it. And as Linda said, to the extent you're pushing the responsibilities down and there's already been an established, and I'm not sure if we should discuss this in open session about potential litigation, but just generally you- Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just saying we don't have to push it down. We have a superintendent. And, there, and that's what I think what Linda was saying in terms of right. the work. Um, okay. You really can't. Okay. Finish Our superintendent, we can't, we can't discuss this, but if you, you read the contracts, that's all I'm saying is the, the work that, that get, has to be divided or however we have to do this, Linda has to work it out. That's part of her duties as a superintendent. And I think she can handle that. Well, uh, my question is, I do not believe the teachers can handle any more than they can. They have their hands full. They work so hard to try to educate our kids the best they can. And we're, we're not only is it abnormal what's going on. Lee, Lee our, our teachers, working. 
Our teachers are great, but uh, we had a list of 40 teachers. We had a list of 40 teachers that nobody knew about that were going to get cut. I've ever met. These are the people on the ground right now running with these kids. I'm not going to argue. Just I, it was my turn. You're saying it as if, but you're saying it as if the teachers can't handle it. Have you spoken to them? Do you know that? The teachers are working so hard as it is. I talk to them also. The teachers well, have they're doing an incredible kids. job are, are they in, a, in a very me, difficult Jackie. and challenging Jackie, time. stop. Just stop. So what are you telling her to stop for? She's saying something because like I was just, speaking. What about the teachers? She doesn't have to stop. I you can't speaking. just cut her off and tell her to stop. I was she speaking. She can say good things about the teachers just because she doesn't have to campaign and you are. She's allowed to talk. But I was speaking first, just like you were speaking first. I apologize. I think you guys should apologize now because I'm speaking. The teachers have to teach the kids. They don't have time to analyze how to do this one, how to do that. They do not have that. They're, they are up to their heads with work. They're up to their heads with responsibility. They can't take on more responsibility. I'm sorry. They Lee, work I too teacher, hard. Lee, I, I, I need to answer that back. You? A teacher is not going to take on Lee, a an abolished title on, position. They're not saying, taking on that role. They're, on, they're a teacher. That's for directors. What super does? That's not you what, know what? teacher's going to do. Whatever you guys right, want. Right, exactly, Jackie. You want it. I cannot support this bed. Bad, whatever it doesn't matter if you support it. We we voted. I don't, support it. You Everyone voted your way. We vote. Vote. You already voted to get rid of an AP at Cherokee. So, I mean, Based come on. on. You so did you. Everybody voted. We made our vote. Let's yes, move on no, now. No, I want to talk about that for a minute. Hold on, Eileen, if you don't mind. Okay. Excuse All school. right, guys. Your school? I'm sorry, it's your school, right? Lee, your you didn't school. have a problem getting rid of an AP position at an elementary Ooh. school that is the size of a middle school. It is the size of the middle school with young children that have possible challenges. Along with, after along the with pandemic, Eileen, along with Mark, and along with Mylan and Lee. Remember four that. people. Not Lee, four people. It was four people that decided that. Well, you were one of them. You were one of them, not me. You wanted you to span wanted. the high school. You wanted to span the whole high school, but you wanted to keep your school intact. That's not, and that is not it's true. Not her Let school. me tell you what the difference is. Let me tell you what the difference is. She had her opinion. We had a different opinion. Need Lee, that's it. More help. hundred students in, in your that, school. Me and I said we would prefer school. to bring in somebody as a disciplinary, and we would like to bring in somebody for YFS and another psychologist. We want to bring extra mental health to the high school. We want to bring a I didn't see that added onto the, the budget. School. That's what we want that. to bring in. I didn't you see we're that. We're doing a budget discussion budget. tonight. We're doing a budget discussion tonight. Here's what budget. I saw. I saw a list of 40 teachers that I didn't even know about go out to the teachers to be cut. That's right. Because we had no money. We had to cut. On March we had to make that was cut. a discussion. 40 I, there was no plus, cuts. Wait, wait, you want to know something? Wait, wait, you want to just say something? Clerical. just trying to bring to the union. That list was huge for all the crazy thing. The people that made it. We had no money. We had no money. Right. We were in a fiscal, no a money. fiscal crisis. But we got to cut now, 40 teachers. Now all of a sudden, teachers. there's abolishments. All of a now sudden, there's abolishments. Right. And money's falling out of the sky. Money's it falling is. It's out just, of the it's sky. It's magically appearing. All of a sudden. All of a sudden. But it, there's no corruption. There's no corruption in this district. Please give me a break. Okay. Can we move on now? Okay. So we're moving on to the uh, twenty. 20, 2021 budget discussion. Um, Bridget, are you on to have that discussion? Yes, I am. Proceed. Mylene, why, why don't you just call us in order because I'm sure we all have some questions. Okay. We'll let her present and then I will start with you, Eileen, and we'll work our way down after she presents. You might want me to go last. Oh. Let's start with most recent and then we will go backwards. So with the energy performance contract on the very last page of the line by line in the 9,000 series, the reason why we are taking off the 1.8 is because SED and the way that it works with being provided, sending all the information up to the state for SED approval is that you cannot get any um, approval uh, 
for financial borrowing until you have that approval from the state. So our financial advisors, Munistat, we have been on the phone with them for weeks and weeks. We've been on the phone with our architect. We've been on the phone with John Allen, working as a cabinet to see with everything transpiring in the new norm, as, as Governor Cuomo loves to say, and all the construction pro projects that have been delayed because of coronavirus, that there will be no approval until at least October. So if it's until October that we can have approval from FED, it will be until at least October that we can get approved for borrowing through Munistat and through Hawkins Bellafield, uh, the, the um, legal counsel for, for that borrowing. It is a year from the time that you borrow that your payments come due. So payments would not hit in the 2021 school year, which is why they have been removed. Uh, the one point eight has been removed from EPC because it will not hit in the 21, 2021 school year. So money isn't falling out of the sky. You have all hit it on the head that coronavirus has changed all aspects of life. And this is one of those many things. So in being fiscally prudent, and truly going line by line over and over again to find more and more money. Because as you know, from any time between April 1st to March 31st, 2021, the director of budget under Cuomo's guidance can make us assessments and adjustments depending on how much revenue the state receives. So the state does not receive 100% of, of their revenue source. School districts cannot receive 100% of state aid. So if we go all the way back to February, when I had given a presentation, that February number was from the February 15th data update. So that state aid run number that the state gave to us after all the, the deeper work that we went into to make sure we're receiving 100% aid and would receive as much as humanly possible without any of these pan pandemic situations going on, the number that the state gave to us was 55 million. So that number was already lower by 600,000 from 1920 because the 1920 state aid number was $56 million. Okay, can you so going me forward me? from- Bridget, go ahead. so what are the savings so yep. far this year now that we- I thought we were off? letting Bridget do her presentation and then we were gonna go in order. Well, she is, but I'm asking her to make, to make it- Right, you're so going I out of order. Understand. You're just gonna jump in. What exactly are you <clears throat> taking off the budget right now as you speak? $600,000? So, no, I will proceed. Lee, let her finish, write down your questions, and then when you turn, we'll, we'll, okay. we'll do it that way. So since Governor Cuomo April 1st had come out with the revised budget because of the pandemic and everything else going on, the pandemic adjustment amount had backed out with federal situations and monies being dumped into there that we would no longer receive at least the 56 million that we received in 1920. And instead we, we would be receiving 55. So that is the difference of 600,000 right there. However, he noted, and the rumor has, has been that we could see cuts in state aid, not only in 2021, but also from the remainder of the 1920 school year because of the, of the assessment periods through the director of budget and the revenues that the state received to determine how much school districts can receive in state aid. So those four assessment periods are April 1st, May 1st, um, December, and March of, of 2021. So waiting until May 15th, which is the next time the school districts will see the revenue that we can anticipate, the rumor currently is that we could see reductions anywhere from 5% to 20%. A 20% reduction would be $11 million backed out of that $55 million one revenue source. So if you back out that, in an email that I had sent the other day, I had, gave, I had given the 5%, 10%, 15%, 15%, 20% reductions, what it would look like as a whole. So if we went with 20% uh, reduction to state aid, that would back out the $199 million revenue number that we have. Because as you know, both the revenue side of the budget and the expenditure side of the budget have to balance by law. Backing out $11 million from that would be roughly $188 million. So if you went backwards to the 18-19 school year, the 18-19 school year, the adopted budget was $192,000. If we saw a 20% reduction in aid for 2021, we would be going backwards to 17-18 and, and prior to that. 
So that is the gravity of the situation. The biggest issue with what we're, what Bridget is presenting right now is we won't have that number until next Friday. The governor has a, 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 a meeting in order to give us budget numbers. And he has said that the budget run will come out on May 15th. Um, the New York State School Superintendents Association believes that that number will come in more in the 10% range of cuts, which would be $5.5 million. But we're all guessing at this point what the revenue side will actually look like. What Bridget began the discussion with was a, a, a bad thing happening and potentially yielding a good result. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID and the New York State pause that we're under, there are going to be multiple projects that cannot be accomplished this summer because it was non-essential work to get some of the quotes and the, and the folks from um, construction in to look at some of our projects. So this summer, it was supposed to be the HVAC um, upgrade at Sycamore and that has now been put on the back burner. We also, as at this point, do not still have state aid approval for OBMS and RMS's LGI, although thankfully the approval for the high school library has come through. So the energy performance contract, which was the original figure that uh, Bridget was backing out, was another thing that was put on, on a delay because of New York cause. Um, and once Bridget had spoken to Munistat, at the delay, uh, they, they said to us that that line, um, that expense will, which was put on the books for next year, will no longer need to be on the books for next year. So that's um, good news coming in a time of, of kind of bad news. So what, are, what, are these, what are these numbers? Hey, Brid wait, 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 did Bridget finish her presentation? No, I'm, I'm almost there. So in my updates that I send, I had sent an update on April 10th. That update April 10th had provided some adjustments that were made to the budget with an updated line by line. Another explanation about the director of budget and the governor and any shifts that would happen in between now and next year. For the remainder of 1920, we are still owed $12 million in state aid. So it's not just 2021 that we have to worry about. We have to also worry about closing out 1920. So if the state does not receive 100% in revenues and they have to start to back out by taking out state aid to school districts, we're going to see even less in 1920. So that's even before we, we begin 2021. So my memos to the board have explained that any cuts that we make now will put us in a better situation um, May 15th, depending on what the D Director of Budget and Governor Cuomo have to say, and the three other assessment periods between now and next March of 2021. So the, the, the more adjustments we can make now, the more that me and my team can go line by line. And although it may seem that money is, is falling out of the sky, it's, it's only as good as the information that Governor Cuomo gives us. So on Friday was the first day that School districts learned throughout the state of New York that school was canceled for the remainder of the year. So, you know, Cuomo gave that information at 12 p.m. And four hours later, after devastating teachers and, and principals and, and schools alike, he told us that the budget vote would be on June 9th. The only guidance he gave school districts is that the budget vote would be by uh, absentee ballot. He provided no further uh, guidance or information, no dates that that items would be would be due. And we've been left to scramble as a team altogether, leaning on other school districts, because we've never seen this before in our lifetime, to make sure that we're abiding and adhering to, to law, that uh, we're adhering to purchasing guidelines, that we are adhering to um, interpretations set by uh, interpretations that Gersio provides the school district as far as the timeline to make it to the June 9th budget vote date. So we have to send out now 30,000 absentee ballots, whereas traditionally the Connecticut School District only sees about 1,800 voters historically. So now we have to spend uh, roughly $100,000 to send out 30,000 ballots because you have to also um, pay for the postage to and from, which is roughly $30,000 
on top of three envelopes, an envelope to go to a, a home, another envelope to hold the ballot inside, and another envelope for that ballot to be sent back to the school district to count on the budget vote day. So there are a lot of working parts and information is changing daily. I'm sure you all see Governor Cuomo. He's on the news every single day at roughly 11.45 in the morning giving updates and maybe every, every three days he'll provide a little bit more about what it might look like for schools. And that's all I have. So uh, Aileen, do you wanna start first? No, I'll go last, Lee can go first. Oh, that's okay, Eileen. Okay, I'd like to hear what you have to say. You've been you put enough pressure on me for the night. Go ahead. I put pressure on you. Let the other board members go first, because I'm sure they have less questions than I have. I have a lot of questions. I'll go. go you want me to go? Go ahead, go ahead, Jackie. All right. Let's start. Let's start with the elephant in the room: arming guards. So, when we put arming guards on. Uh, this question is actually going to be for Linda to explain to the community. We had said it was $500,000, which is not actually true. It was actually came in at 300 and change, almost 400, but we cushioned the number in case there was extra added expenses for additional things. So we, as the Board of Ed, did that. Nobody else, we and the administration with there with that. When we went to go cut the cut this budget and make it less, because it was there was too much, too many things. We were three million over. We we didn't have enough. All of a sudden, four hundred thousand dollars showed up a day after we abolished positions. So positions were abolished and four hundred thousand was found. Don't get me wrong, I think you guys did a great job. My link kit, you absolutely, she absolutely finds, you find a bunch line by line, you absolutely do. But here's the thing that I don't understand. Now here we are, how much do armed guards actually cost, Linda? That's the question I'd like you to answer for the community. How much this year would arming guards cost? Go ahead. So, and as have an armed guard the way that we ask to staff at every building and who at the high school was approximately $380,000. Why, why when we originally made the original proposal to put $500,000 in the budget was because overtime on that contract is actually time and a half and double time if we were looking for a Sunday, time and a half if we were looking for nights and time and a half if we were looking for uh, Saturdays. And the board wanted to leave the opportunity open that if we wanted to have armed guards at events at the school that were not during the school day, that that $120,000 would be the cushion for us to allow us to do that kind of uh, assigning of staff. Okay, here's the other thing. Here's my other question. What is it actually going to cost this year if the money was found? Money's found in the budget, found in spots. We didn't utilize all money from last year. Can you can you give us that a roundabout number? I don't understand the question, Jackie. So things that are not being expensed now because we're closed? Is that the well, question? No, I, I, I want you to tell them how much would the actual line budget be? In, in order to just cover the school days, about $380,000. If you wanted to leave some money in there, but we actually, I don't believe we actually came to a conclusion from, from uh, Mr. Flynn's presentation as to exactly how the, we his wanted to presentation, it. His presentation sounded like it's a lot less than we're discussing right now. Am I wrong? I'm just I, questioning, I, am I wrong? We all heard the same presentation, I'm just asking. So there's a differential. So, and this was something that we discussed. We discussed it with the committee. We had the PowerPoint put up with all of the different scenarios. And the differential is the difference between having a regular guard and an armed guard. That differential is about $23 an hour. So it really depends on how many armed guards we're looking to put in place. Um, I, I see 
I see Mr. Flynn's presentation. I don't see the original presentation with the 11 armed guards and the difference if we took, if we were doing 10, I see his presentation saying that if we did only 10, it would be a difference of $334,000. We originally asked for 11, that was about $380,000, but it leaves absolutely no room for any other events that are not during school hours. Well, we're not even sure what events are gonna be allowed. Right now, we, we are not, we have no idea when Governor Cuomo is going to open up, open up the state and allow anything, no yeah. less if we're going to have, I only can hope and pray that we have sports for the kids and clubs going forward, but we don't have any idea what, the, what September looks like right now. That's correct. Okay. But what I heard in that presentation was there's money that could be, that could be, that could absolutely, there is money that can be used towards that. Toward offsetting this cost? Yes, from the line itself. So what what Mr. Flynn spoke with Mrs. Uh, Villarreal about was some of the equipment that didn't get purchased this year and instead using that money for equipment for next year. Um, it, it would be a transfer to do it from a, a supply code into a, into a, uh, a code to pay for people, um, to a personnel or a budget code. So um, is there offset? If the board wants to utilize fund balance to offset this budget, you can't just take that money from this year and use it next year without the board putting that on the budget that way. I understand. I'm just saying, I just wanted to clarify because there has been a lot of rumors of how much things cost. And instead of it being rumored, I wanted the truth to be put out there. And the truth that there is money in the budget, that we actually are in a surplus now, not a deficit. And that, that we're in a surplus, not a deficit. And that this is something that all of a sudden, and I get that money came out from the new executive order. But I'm just saying, the way that we've seen every day, more money found, found, found. My, that, was my big, that was my big question. So that was done in public, Jackie. When we originally did the presentation, um, I'm going to say that was what, January or February? I think it was January. When we originally did the presentation in January, those numbers were very, were very public, um, that it was about $380,000 to arm guards across the district. We did make that deliberate choice, the board and the and administration made the deliberate choice to give us some leeway in order to staff those events. Of course, that's before the COVID crisis hit. So yeah, I think everything's being looked at um, a, 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 as everybody's looking at. And when things change, like the energy performance contract and the timing, um, that helps us that helps us decrease the budget. That's really well, just that's part of the budgeting process. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like I said, the reason that I will always be for safety and security of our kids and the mental health aspect to go along with it is let's just look at the pandemic, for instance. The pandemic, it occurred. Impulse shoppers go out, they buy all these items. One of the number one items that was bought, everyone thinks it was just toilet paper. It wasn't. The number one item on Long Island that they couldn't even find outside of toilet paper was guns. Guns and ammo, you can't even buy it on Long Island right now. These same guns and ammos are bought by people who were never trained tactically to own them, never trained to secure them, never trained to safeguard them. Now these are in the homes of a lot of our students, okay? Not to say anything would ever be done intentionally, but even the most tactical of us have had it where if, you're, if your firearm or if your weapon is not safeguarded, what becomes the issue? Well, the issue becomes that September, October could be very scary for schools. Could be very, very scary. Somebody should pull the FBI stats right now and start reading of 1920 versus the year before. That's what I have to say. Next one, you guys are up. I got, I'm Mark, do you have any questions?
Mark, Mark, do you have any? I'm sorry, I said I'm good. I, did, I, I guess it's on mute. I took it off. Okay. Uh, can I ask right. you, I'll, I'll go. Edley. Linda, can you tell us all the money that we're supposed to be saving right now? How much money are we saving? In detail. Um, first of all, let me, first of all, this 38, before I say that, this $3,800, I was listening to this conversation when you did, you know, we're talking about the uh, uh, high school and they have the uh, different things that go on there and, and, and um, football games and things like that, that you were talking about having armed guards there. And that is why the extra 1200 went into the bud, into your decision making, into the board's majority's decision making on uh, to add a total of 500,000. But I would Leah, like to. I just want to step you, on. Wait, I, I want to just excuse me for one minute. I just want to say, I understand what you're saying about the 120. There's no discussion that we, that, that, that we, that I didn't know it was in there. The discussion is just that. Nobody put it in there but us, the Board of Ed and administration as a cushion. But the real number, the real number to the public that we, we shouldn't be saying a million dollars, a million dollars, it's not. Let's just give them the real numbers. Real number is 500,000. Am I wrong or 550,000? I don't know. You're wrong, Lee. Well, 500,000 is in the budget right now. What? 500,000 still exists in the budget right now. If you want to cut the extra, the potential of having them at extra events, we could cut that now, but that right now it is 500,000 existing in the budget. But I, I was under that impression. Anyway, uh, my question is, Linda, can you go over the things that we are saving money on um, and just detail and then tell us how much? So I don't think I can actually tell you how much. Um, or approximately. So we're, we're looking, one of the biggest expenses that we're not expending right now is substitutes. Um, you know, when, when we have classes that go on events, when we have teachers that are absent for illness and other reasons, um, when we have professional development, uh, we ha ha supply quite a few subs every day. So one of the- Wait, one of the me, can I stop you right there for a second? The, the, this money that you're talking about, can it be utilized next year? Or does it have to go into a fund? This particular money you're, you're talking about. So we, we, the board can make a decision and that's why I sent home the um, PowerPoint from February 25th. So if you look at the PowerPoint from February 25th, the board can make a decision as part of revenue to take any surplus funds from this year and rather than refunding some of the uh, revenue, revenue sources of our, um, I'm sorry, let me find the page. So our, our fund balance, instead of refunding our reserves, um, we can add that money as undesignated or an appropriate fund balance that is surplus monies from this year into next year's budget. That, okay. would, but that would be give part me the, of- give, give me the examples of which, which codes you can do that on if not all codes, I mean, can we do it with toilet paper? Or, could, or is it just certain codes you can do it with? Um, it, it depends on the funding source on the code, which is what I explained in the document that um, we, we shared. If it's coming from federal grants and the like, there are some ways to roll those monies over and carry them over. Uh, but the majority of our funds come from taxpayer money. So if those funds are not expensed in the school year, they become fund balance, they become surplus. Generally what the board has done is replaced the money that we've taken out of reserves in the last year's budget. So that way we would keep our budget steady. Um, but the board can certainly appropriate fund balance in order to decrease taxpayer, in order to increase our revenue. And that can come from all, all um, codes that are general fund codes. I have mine all written down. Can you give me the, can you now go over the money that we would be saving that we can reduce our budget line or uh, we can reduce our budget by X? Can you go over those? 
And just so tell Bridget, us what they are. Um, that, that's when we close the books that we get that really locked down tight. I don't know if Bridget can even give us a, a, a ballpark I, because that would be something, um, I think it would be a real ballpark at this point. Send us something we can't some even determine that yet because we don't know what the first assessment is going to look like from the governor's office. Didn't you now send it's us too some soon savings, to though? even determine that. But didn't you send us some savings on certain loans? Yes, some, some potential sa savings that we foresee, of course, but to, to give you a dollar amount right now is just a, is a, a little bit ahead of the game. And, and one of the real reasons what Bridget just said is when the governor gives us a line by line budget on May 15th, he could be pulling money out of this year's state aid, out of the current operational year. So some of these savings that we're seeing by not buying as much paper, by not renting out our graduation chairs, by not having substitutes in the district, all other salaries district-wide are being paid. And the, more, the, the, the largest majority of any district's expenditures are salary. And all of our salaries are being paid, including part-timers, including and the board did a resolution in order for us to enact the CARES Act and, and get monies back from the federal government that everybody stayed on payroll. So the largest majority of our costs are payroll costs and they're still in place. There are some other places like substitutes, like some purchases, like paper, like um, the graduation setup that we rent. They're smaller costs that we are not needing to expense because the kids aren't in the buildings. Um, unfortunately, those may be taken up by the governor taking away some of our state aid for this year on May 15th. After we see whether or not he cut has cut all the districts on May 15th, we might be able to give you a little bit more information as to what we can look to appropriate into next year's balance, into next year's uh, budget. To, to date, um, we have suggested as an administrative team that we appropriate $3.6 million of fund balance. We also, it's, uh, it, it's again in that presentation that um, it doesn't have pages numbered, but it is, um, we, I sent it home in your packet. It's after historical tax levy information. The next slide shows the revenue sources. This is also on our, um, our district-wide page. If uh, there are folks at home who are watching this under uh, budget and, and voting information, this presentation is February 25th, 2020, where we show how we are taking money out of our reserves, which is basically our savings accounts in order to keep the budget for next year um, under the cap. Can I just ask you something? Is there, what is the actual reserve number then we are gonna have in there today? Uh, not today, after, for the budget this year. Everything is like, everything is like, what's so, um, What are we looking to keep in the reserve for this year after the budget? After we go for the budget, what is going to be the reserve for this year? So what is left over for surplus, Jackie? Is that what you're asking? Yes. That's what we were just explaining, that we can't give you a number yet because we're not sure what state aid is going to come in and if it's going to pull out of the savings that we're actually seeing by not having kids in the district. So next, next Friday, we may be able to get dial that in a little closer for you so that we can kind of take a look at what we would normally have expensed by now that we're not because of the kids not being in the buildings and whether or not state aid has been diminished this year. Linda, since you're on that topic, I'm gonna to jump in because I have, that's one of my questions. Um, last year we had over $5 million, right? Left over the year um, before. Yeah. The year before, right before I got on the board, it was like nine and a half million, and that and that board voted to put it in reserves. Correct. Uh, some of it. Remember some we of put it that, we, pay off that. There are budget. There. That, it was like nine and a half million dollars, right? That we we funded a reserve. Uh, I mean, well, every year we fund a reserve. Every year we fund reserves with the, the surplus. There's always been a surplus at the end of every year. Sometimes it's five million. That's why when I when you first started, we, and we were at the fifteen percent. And now we're down to 4.1. That mm -hmm. was always one of my biggest things, correct? 
that there was that we well generally what you try to do and maybe Bridget can explain it better than me is no I, I understand what we try to do but now in these times with all this money that's always left over every single year um, you know we need to not fund the reserves and because it's we always have money unexpensed but we've used the reserve to balance the budget. So what you want to do is replenish that because if you don't replenish that, you won't be able to use the reserve the next year and you'll have a deeper deficit to overcome. It just when was seems the last like time we used money out of reserve, Linda? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Eileen. When, when was the last time we used money out of reserves? We use it every year. How much money have we used out of reserves this year? So this year we it, haven't used any money out of the reserves. Okay, what did we use last year? Out of the reserves. Out of the reserves last year. My phone is we dying, I gotta two, swap it out. 2.19 for ERS, we used 500K for employee benefits. Two point for ERS uh, and employee uh, benefits out of the reserves. Uh, we had to pay that about out. Five, about five million in reserves. We and we spent that out of the reserves to fund those balances because we didn't put enough in the budget for those. No. So you're you're uh, you authorized by June before you close out the budget to apply some of the reserve into the coming year's budget. So the revenue slide that you see typically from January until the budget ado is adopted, that is so that you can balance the revenue side to your expenditure side. I'm sorry, budget. Can you, uh, Bridget, can you say that one more time? So you're trying to balance your revenue budget to your expenditure budget. So you utilize reserves. So when you close out your 1819, you're utilizing some of those reserves to fund for 1920. So the board will see those those transfers by close June 30 of that year. There has to be a re resolution by the board in order to do so. And you typically do that just before you close the books. Right. But again, you're talking about the transfers now. So I'll go back to my original question from there on your first meeting. Maybe you might have forgotten. I, I did ask for a transfer list, and I just uh, brought that up again in an email. I did not forget. You actually did bring it up again in February, right. and I apologize. I haven't gotten that to that's you. That's okay. But I just I, wanted to remind sure you, you so understand. that's the other thing that we were talking about is transfers. I can't get a good picture without that list. Um, so I'd really appreciate to have that before we have to vote on this budget. So I'm glad you brought that up. I'll take that off my list, too. Um, but again, my, my question is that every year, for at least the past five or six years, um, there has always been a surplus that has funded reserves. There has always been a surplus. And it varies from in the, in the millions, correct? Right, yes. Yeah. So for 1819, okay. we funded $7.2 million to right. the reserves. Right. And the year before that was a big $9.5 million. And then last year, it, it was like $5 million, I think. I'm not really sure. Correct. Okay, so this year, what do you have in the reserve funds? And I'm sorry, I kind of cut off, but you guys were on this topic, so I wanted to jump in. How much is are we? Do you have in the budget for the reserve funds? So the the balance of the reserves is still that seven point two number. So since we funded those reserves, we haven't done anything with them, and we won't do anything until you guys see another resolution, either later this month or in June. And that's really depending on how we're looking towards year end and what our auditors will, will and will not allow, because obviously so, we're subject to internal, external, and o also OSC. So when we vote on the budget, that reserve money is, the, the, not that reserve money, I'm sorry, the unexpensed money that's at the end of this year, which again, we won't know right away, that money is not part of the next year's budget. So the appropriated balance, the appropriated fund balance on that revenue slide is 3.6 to fund the, the 2021 budget. For 1920, it was 3.1. Uh -huh. So in my point in my email to you, um, I believe it was sometime last week, but days are just blending together. Because yeah, there's of 135 emails in the last two weeks. So. <laughs> 
Yeah, yes. I know, Bridget. But you need to keep appropriating the same amount year over year. And if you and if you don't, so let's say uh, an example that I gave the other day was one million. Let's say right. we have a surplus and we can put instead of the three point one or three point six, we can put four point six. It's not sustainable because you need to then keep the 4.6 going forward every single year after. So in the 2008 financial crisis, that's what districts were doing. They were pumping in as much appropriated fund balance as they possibly could to make up for that shortfall, but they're still trying to get out of that habit today. So before right. anything even happens but at, with- But with, at this point, so what, people, what, what they did was then they started funding reserves so that they didn't have to have that full amount for the following years. I, I, get, I get that part. Um, yes. The other my problem point with is reserves this, so, is that you're really- Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. The other problem with reserves is that you're really limited in what you can do. And that was uh -huh. my, my final really big explanation. Um, and, and that's also in the 40-page the document, which- you know, as you know, that that took a lot uh, yeah. of time, and it wasn't something that I could delegate out because well, my emails are my personal well. emails from the board. Yes, yes. So, um, um, but we yes. could vote as a board to not take that excess money and not fund reserves. That's correct, but then you're also extremely limited in what you can do. So I would highly advise against putting it into appropriated fund balance because, as I explained, if you wanted to pump in an additional one million dollars on top of that three point six we'd have to sustain that going forward. And then not knowing what's going to happen with the director of budget and governor Cuomo with state aid, it's not sustainable because we wouldn't be able to continue to fund that. If we do see a 10% reduction in aid that will significantly impact. What happens our if you can't fund it? If you, if you can't fund it, you have to try to, uh, you can override the, the tax cap because obviously there would be nothing that we'd be able to do with state aid. You can adjust your reserve. But so, for example, unemployment reserve is limited to the expense that you have in the prior year. So for 1819, it's only $55,000. So we cannot continue to fund that until we expend more than that. Then it would be right. by board resolution to the board to say, yes, we can appropriately fund it above the 55, depending on the true expenditure that we have. Does that make right. sense? Yeah, no, it does. Um, I don't know if, if everybody if everybody got that, but I, yes, I got it. Um, but it is doable. It's, there's a lot to do to make it work, but it is doable if we needed that excess unexpensed funds. It's not the best answer, but it's money that we have. Right. So the other okay. thing that, that you've seen previously is with your unassigned fund balance. So uh, as you said before, unassigned fund balance is the law is 4%. We're over that right now, so that's something that we have to transfer before we close out the year, June 30th, mm -hmm. 2020. Right. And where are we bringing that down to now that you brought that one up? <laughs> See, you're asking all my questions now. I'm sorry, whoever's turn it was, I'm sorry that I jumped in. but So it's about $200,000 that we're over that 4%. So we want, you want to get it at exactly the 4%, not lower than that? Because a lot of districts uh, keep it between 3 and 3.5, and, and we're correct. at the limit at 4 Right. There are school districts that keep it at about three. Where, where I came from, it was, it was three on the dot. But that's subject to what the board, you know, as a, as a whole, what they, what they would like that to look like. Okay. So then here's my question to you then. And you might not know the answer right now, um, but if you can get it to us, that would be great. If we, if we went down to three, what would, our, um, what would that net us? And if we went to three and a half, what would that net us instead of the four? Okay. okay. All right, I'll, go, I'll give somebody else their turn back, and then I'll go back to my questions later. Lee, were you done with your questions? <clears throat> oh, it was Lee. I jumped in. I'm sorry. Thank you, Lee, for letting no, me do that. Okay. I appreciate the, it. The three and three and a half, say you reduce it to that, what would be our liability? I don't think there is a liability, but that's Bridget. I'm just curious. That's the law. I mean, the law is under 4%, so you could, as a board, we could do it however we want, I think being at 4% is cutting it close because typically this is the first time that we followed the law. Before that, um, it was at 15% at one point. And that was under Dr. Groveman. He likes to save money. Well, that was illegal. Not illegal, but, well, yeah, illegal. <laughs> right, and it's getting harder and harder to do the more that we see state aid decrease. 
Right. So, Bridget, where do you think? Ahead. Bridget, Sorry. where do you think? Yeah. Do you like the four percent, or would you think it's better at three? I really need to see what happens May fifteenth. Okay. That's why I asked it for the numbers, Mark, because you can't really know that yet. So that's why I want to see what our numbers would be at the three, at the three and a half, and where where we are at the four. So what reserves what reserves must you um, fund? There's no must, I don't think. I, that's a board. That's a board decision. Well, I'm asking about the. Um, I just want to see what Bridget. Is there any that we oh. must fund, Bridget? Yes. So a lot of them are going into the 40 page document. Hold on one second. A lot of them are based on liability and expenditure. So for example, workers' compensation. Let me turn to that page in the financials. You okay over there? Yeah. I think it you. sounded like Lee. That was me. Bless you, Lee. Thank you. Okay, so if you happen to have the financials or would look to, like to look at them another day, they're on the website. If you go to page 16, you can see our liabilities. It is both our long and short-term liabilities. So it's our liabilities within one year and thereafter. So two examples at once. So one line is the compensated absence payable. That is our employee benefit liability. That is 13.1 million. So you have to make sure depending on that liability for the full duration that you have enough in your reserve that you can pay that out. So let's say um, there's an influx of teacher that re retire, re teachers that retire at the same time. We have to, depending on the contract language, pay out their vacation time, pay out their sick time, anything else that's, that's due to them on, on the day that they retire. So another document, I'm not, I'm not sure if I had put it into the 40 page document because it's still a working, pay, working document, but I had given the example of the reserves and the percentage that they're funded so both workers' compensation and the employee liability reserve are both fully funded to be able to cover that full liability because that's what the district is responsible for. Now for ERS and for TRS, it depends on the entire salary total for every teacher the, or every uh, total salary line for every person at a part of ERS. And it's a percentage that you must put in to be able to cover that year after year. So is it two reserves that we must, it sounds like you're saying there's two reserves? No, workers' compensation, you have to cover that for the full liability. Right. Unemployment insurance, you need that, which especially in not knowing what's going to happen May 15th and thereafter through the four assessment periods through next year. Okay, it's so possible if we do, go ahead. So let's, 
so let's go to the unemployment. Um, that six hundred dollars. Are we re are we responsible for that six hundred dollars? What do you mean? Uh, I don't know when that how long that incentive will be, but those that are retired, I'm sorry, those that are collecting unemployment, there's an additional six hundred dollars. Is that our responsibility? That they get it from the federal government, Mylin. That's what you're talking about. Yeah, do we lay it out first and then we get refunded no. back? Like, how does that work? So that's something that they're anything. still going. That's something that they're still going back and forth with at the state level and federal level. So the Department of Labor confirmed that the federal slash state will cover about 50% of the cost of unemployment benefits for those filing between March and December of this year, and then after that, the state will come back to us and take off 50% of our quarterly payment. So in that coming July, we should see a full reduction of reduction of that in our bill. But it's really depending on what happens with COVID-19 going forward. So it's 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 something that's very fluid. I think what people are confused about, and, Bridget, is that the unemployment insurance and how that works. Okay. It's it's uh it's it's a bear and it's changing so much right now because of of everything that's that's going on so um yes you have to absolutely book an expenditure on the expenditure side but you also have to be you know cognizant of the revenue that that you have coming in but it's hard to say the revenue that would come in because we also can't really anticipate or know at what point somebody would get a job will we have to pay out for two months? Is it, is it something that's gonna job right away or will it be for the full 39 plus weeks, depending on yeah, no, how I, that changes? I, think, I don't think I explained myself to you and my link can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what people thought is that we send, if somebody's out on unemployment, that our school district cuts them a check. That's not true. No. Even if they, even if they get the $600 from the federal and say they get $300 from state unemployment, we don't cut a check even to sit for the whole three hundred dollars. We pay a percentage nope. to the insurance company. Yes. Right. So that's what people weren't understanding that that it's a percentage that everybody in the world pays. Any business that's self insured, you pay a percentage to your workers' comp insurance and they and that workers' comp your unemployment insurance, it's taken out of everybody's taxes and, and that's how it works. It's not you don't pay we don't give somebody a check for three hundred dollars because they're out of work. We don't do that. That's Correct. what the state does. Correct. Right. And we only pay a portion of that. But, but Bridget, I thought we were self-insured and we do not have insurance. I, 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 that, was, that was my understanding, and I may be wrong, but I thought we were self-insured and didn't have insurance because we are an, an organization that typically has low turnover. So rather than paying the insurance costs when, we're, when there was not someone who needed to collect years and years ago before I got here, we went to be self-insured. So I believe that that may be slightly different, that we don't pay a percentage because we're not, an, we're not insured. We actually pay what we owe to the state. I, I'm pretty sure we have a workers' comp insurance company. It, no, it's not workers' comp. This is- this I mean, is not workers' comp. Unemployment, sorry. Sorry, unemployment insurance. I, I don't believe that's true. I believe we're self-insured. It goes to the state though, Linda. It, it does go to the state and the state and, bills and us, people but they pay don't it out of their paycheck. It's a they payroll tax deduction. But I believe we're self-insured. We need to, we need to. Yeah. So was I, Linda, when I had my own business, it's a, it's a payroll deduction and it's a percentage. And, and the only true uncertainty is the state portion. We get a bill from the state. We have to pay that based on how many people are unemployed. Correct. Yes. Can, and the only uncertainty is... That's the entire the world uncertainty, does that. Yes. Yes. The only uncertainty is the percentage that they're going to take off on our quarterly payment. That Correct. is the only uncertainty. Right. With, and that with is based on how on. many people are unemployed. Correct. Okay. So it's not the full $900, which I think, Linda, was the confusion on the whole John Pearl discussion. People thought that we were given them the check for six hundred dollars from the federal and three hundred dollars or whatever it was that they were getting from unemployment for their state, which is not the case. We don't right. cut that check. Correct. At that, at that moment, we weren't sure how the funding source was going to do for the federal. Right, but even so, we, right, and we, right, we still don't know that. But still, even the three hundred dollars is not a check from us. It's a we 
it's payroll taxes. It's funded by payroll taxes and a percentage based on how many people are unemployed. I mean, I'm sure we're a school district. I'm sure ours is not low, our, our rate, but it's never 100%. But I don't believe we're I don't believe we're insured. I believe we're self we're self insured because it would be it, it would be high because we're a large employer, and we're we have typically low turnover. So I believe years ago there was some discussion. I think you should look into that. I don't think that's true anymore. I don't think they do that. It's again because it's payroll taxes. But you can I'm sure you can find that out. But yeah. I'd like that answer too. That would be a good answer to know. Yep. And Mylan, now I just jumped in on your question too. So back at you. Well, so I just want to understand this. So, Bridget, we we have to fund one of the reserves, two of the reserves. I just want to get, you know, I just want to get that clear in my head. <clears throat> you you have to fund. You, you don't have to fund the reserves. I will send out a, a more detailed explanation. Um, this way, you can have it, and then you can look at it side by side with the financials. And I think that will be really, really helpful to be able to see it side by side with those financials. So, Malin, I think your question is: If we don't have the money, do, do we do we have to save? And the truth is, you can't mandate a state. The state can't mandate that the district puts money into a savings account. And reserves are savings accounts for very specific purposes. So what the auditors do is they say, okay, if you can fund the workers' comp reserve, this is what you should fund it to because this could potentially be your liability. And if you need to dip in for someone who's been hurt on the job, that's where that needs to be. But if, you're, if you don't have money, you don't fund your reserves. So if there's no surplus coming out at the end of a budget, then you can't refund your reserves. And they, no, one, no one can force you to do that. Okay. So then my next question is with the New York State employee, uh, employee health insurance, do we normally go out for um, bid to see if we are getting competitive pricing? Yes, so we are a part of uh, um, NYSHIP. So that's the insurance um, that allows that to happen exactly that way. They go out and do that for us. Okay, and I'm assuming that will go for the dental and eye vision and stuff like that. Actually, uh, Sharon yeah. last year went out and, and looked at all those policies again, Sharon and Bob. Um, and we actually did save some, some money on the dental and got a better plan. But with the health insurance, we're locked into whatever NYSA tells us? No. Um, nice. And so, some districts do do self-insured plans. Um, it, it's a it's a large bid process, and I, I we would have to look at the CBAs because I truly believe that our CBA, especially for our teachers, does say nice ship. Um, and if we were going to try to change that, I think that would be something that would need to be negotiated. Um, but it is a it's a very large process to try to do move away from nice ship. Um, and most districts who do it go self-insured and they don't wind up doing well a few years in. Okay. No, I'm not saying to do it. I was just uh, thinking of different, uh, I just want to make sure that, you know, it's, it's, we are um, doing our due diligence and, you know, it's getting competitive pricing and that we're not paying top of the dollar there. No, you're right. It's a good question. Um, so with the 1.8, with the, uh, that we, can sort of use, but then we go back to, we don't know what the governor is going to give us in state aid. So how much reserves or cushion should be in the budget and how much do we have now? So planned contingency in the budget right now is about 3.5 million, which is $1.75 for every hundred dollars that we're expensing. Right. So if we would add the 1.8 and then plus I found some monies too, I think Bridget was able to utilize maybe one or two. I think most of them we couldn't touch. So we took the 3.5 and we're adding 1.8 and I guess a couple of the dollars I was able to find, but we still should really be at the 3.5 million. Is, is that, am I understanding that correctly? Um, it, it, if we were not to 
add anything back into the budget right now with that 1.8 we were still at about 400,000 a mile and I don't have exactly the amount of change because there were some of those ones that you asked about that we couldn't do um but uh so it, it, let's let's I, say can you give me a ballpark of what we what we finally said was would work well, no, we were no we were in the around the four hundred thousand dollars to close the gap that, that is right okay right. so take off yeah so take off the four hundred thousand dollars of the 1.8 we right. still have 1.4 do we right. just can it so does that 1.4 had to be expensed um or could it or is it going to be used as a, in addition to the 3.5 so at this moment, if there's no if there's no expenses put back into the budget, we would have four point nine in right. plan contingency, which right. it, it is uh, two dollars and two dollars and forty five cents for every hundred dollars that we we've, we've got as an expense. Now I understand that, but what is the recommended amount to to have as a contingency? You know, as that cushion. Is it, is it generally, so, should it be around 3.5, you know, around, generally around that amount? Typically school districts will do about 2% on the expenditure side and 2% on the revenue side. Okay. So this year is a, is a very strange year though, because we are looking at the potential for more decreases over time. So normally when you get a budget from the state, you can rely on that revenue coming in. With this continuing pandemic that we're dealing with, the revenue is not reliable. Um, I mean, we've already seen one decrease in the state aid run. Uh, fortunately for us, we were lower. <laughs> that's a fortunate thing, unbelie unbelievable, unbelievable, that's a fortunate thing. But we were fortunate enough that we were not cut more in that second budget run. Um, many districts, they, he rolled back, Governor Cuomo rolled back the funding to the 1920 school year level. Our funding this year was $600,000 less than the 1920 school year level. So we were already looking um, at, a, at a tighter budget than most districts. So most districts went back after that second budget run, after COVID began, and had to begin cutting and slashing their budgets. Um, now we're, we're waiting for May 15th to see if the budget run goes even lower. However, that may not be the last time that they cut. So there are multiple more times during over the course of the year, such as August and January, where if the governor does not receive 99% of the revenues that are projected, he can, um, he has the right and the authority to decrease state aid, not just to schools, you know, to hospitals, to all the different things that, that you know, to towns. Um, but he has the, he has the right if he does not receive 99% of the projected revenues. And the longer we take to economically reopen, and unfortunately, you know, Suffolk County has had increased hospitalizations over the last few days. So that 14 day opening where everything needs to uh, get lower and lower over the 14 days, we're going to start new. Um, so we're looking at uh, the unknown. Um, it, it really actually looks very similar to what happened in 1990 when Mario Cuomo was the governor. And in 1990, in January, he cut state aid in the middle of the school year without any notice. Um, this year, at least we have some notice. So we have to be cognizant that, you know, $5 million, $4.9 million may not be enough uh, contingency if we start to get some very drastic cuts. That's a 10% decrease in state aid. That's not even a 10% decrease in state aid. That's what I thought. Um, Marlon, question, can I jump on that question sure. still? I want just to clarify something. Linda, you're saying um, that contingency may not be enough, right, because of the dec decrease. So at that point, we would want to keep that money not in a reserve fund, but out where we could allocate it to use because we're going to be cut from the governor so much. Well, that, possibly yes, yes, but but what okay. I'm thinking about is the is the 2021 budget and the contingency right. that's in the lines that are there right now. Okay. No, I understand that. I'm just saying that that's that's why I asked Bridget earlier for those numbers because mm -hmm. if we can get that down a little bit and still be lawful, and then keep that money in the budget in 
it'll help us if we if we uh, if Cuomo cuts us. Well, you would you would appropriate that into the revenue right. side of the budget. So we're talking right. apples and oranges right now. I think Eileen, I mean, and maybe you're think, you're you're seeing it. I don't, I'm not sure everybody's seeing it that way. So what I'm you're seeing it as unexpensed money that we would normally throw in a reserve that we would now allocate to the budget and as an appropriated fund. Yes. Right. So right. no, I'm on the same page. Okay, but what I was speaking about was what's in the the 2021 budget proposal, not in the revenue side. Oh, I thought you and Mylon were just talking about the three point. That's contingency. Something million funds. dollars that. That's contingency. contingency funds that are currently in the that's expense the budget. Correct. That's not the unexpensed funds. No. No. Oh, okay. Then I apologize. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm, I, I've, uh, as Bridget knows, I've asked a million questions over the last few weeks. I know my questions, uh, some of them, if not most of them, were posted already on the district website. So I'm handing it over to you, Eileen. Lee, were you done? Because I think we jumped on, me and Mylene both cut you off. No, that's okay, I'm done. Okay. Um, so Bridget, on the emails, um, I did ask a couple of questions about individual line items and um, because we, we put a big cushion in on some items. A, a great example tonight was the armed guards. That's $120,000 right there that we put in as a cushion. There is a lot of lines like that in our budget that are cushioned more than we've expensed in the last five years. If you go back and look at all the budgets, um, and I, I have them line by line, I'd be glad to sit with you and go over them. I don't want to take up everybody's time tonight. But there's a lot of lines that will say, say it has a um, million dollars as a budget in, in five years ago, and we spent $800,000. The next year, we went from a million to 1.1, and we spent 825000 So the way we're spending and the way we're budgeting, the budgets are going way higher than the actual spending. So we're doing a rollover budget. That's my point, instead of using the actual figures. There's a lot of lines like that where we could reduce the budget and – not add so much cushion in because in a typical five-year period, we have never spent even what the budget was five years ago. So in other words, if we have a one and a half million dollar budget right now, five years ago was a million dollars. If we went back to the five years ago, we still have not to, to date spent that million dollars that we budget for. There are a couple, there are quite a few lines like that. Okay. I will certainly sit with you because there are other examples where it's not the case. For example, insurance waivers, transportation right, right. gets paid out for this at the end of the year. So last year we paid out $545,000 in June and we ended right. up having to draw down from contingencies because we did not have enough budgeted on that line. Well, see, that's, that's where I don't have the transfer link. So, so I, couldn't, I couldn't tell all those all the time. That's another problem that's going to happen with this year because we only have four hundred and $471,000 left remaining on the line. If we expensed out 545,000 last June, right mm -hmm. there, we don't have enough. So we're going to have to draw down from, from contingencies. So I would, I would. Right. I'm not saying, I'm not saying don't put in a cushion. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we are way higher of a cushion than we sometimes need to be. I understand that you need, I, I, that example that you just gave is perfect. So I'm not saying don't do that. I'm just saying instead of doing it from a rollover, at this point in time, maybe if we tighten it up a little bit, then we won't need we'll, – we know our cushion. If we had never spent – if we put in a million dollars five years ago and we're up to a million and a half and we've only spent – the highest we've ever spent is $850,000, we could tighten that million and a half up. And that's just right. a stupid right. example. You know what I'm saying? So there's, there's a, you know, quite a few lines like that. Um, and, again, I might be wrong on some of them because – there might have been transfers in or out that I don't that I don't know about. Yeah. So okay. I first, if if we could all go back through the forty page document, there's a lot. I don't of have good that stuff right in now. there. Yeah, I'll look at that too. I I don't have that right now. I think it will be a part of my memoir when I pass. Okay. In the future. <laughs> Bridget, I appreciate you asking answering all of our questions. Um, I have uh, just one or two more. Um, uh, and this might be for Linda. You know, like I said, the five hundred thousand dollars that we have budgeted. Um, if it if it's to go through, and I don't know how that's going to go yet. That's not budgeted, set in stone yet. Um, there was talk about reducing it to halfway, so I don't even know where that is at this point. Um, but 
the overtime that you were talking about, Linda, when I'm looking at the security lines now, the overtime was in that BOCES budget if I, when, uh, when we got our report. I don't know if I could say too much about it because it is security, um, but wasn't that through a BOCES line, the overtime? It was in Bridget's BOCES. Oh, Bridget, maybe you can answer. It was in your BOCES report? It was on the BOCES line? Sorry, I'm, 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 I'm muted myself. I didn't mean to do that. So the, the BOCES security line doesn't have anything to do with any of the, the staffing other than Don's salary. Okay. So um, then and there, one, there, was, there was a line about overtime that was not, I mean, we stuck it all in the same line, but it had a separate line for overtime. And Don oh, right. actually addressed that. And, and I, I thought you gave us something about that. I just can't seem to find it in the 135 emails right now. For, that was bef before the time of COVID. That was for any um, after-school activities, so football games or, or any uh, things I can't think of because it's 1030. And, uh, pep, no, not pep rally. Well, homecoming? Yeah, Did I say that? Maybe homecoming. Could have been the pep rally. As, as I explained in the, in the document, those overtime are outside of regular school hours. So no, about, I, I, about yeah. two years ago, we would not have put uh, armed guards, not guards, I'm sorry, I'm not, I don't mean armed guards. Just guards in general, because again, we, I don't we, know if we would armed not guards have put security through. at back to school nights. Um, we would not have put security <laughs> at parent teacher conference nights. So um, we, that line was broken out in order to show that where we were taking the money from when we had security that were not school day related events. Right. And we didn't do right. that. And now it's it, so like ago. we discussed, we discussed this a little earlier. Now it kind of makes it look like security got increased 95% to the general public, but it really didn't. Just that line got broken out. It kind of did, Eileen, just because two years ago, we would not have put guards there. And now, well, we that I understand, but that's, that these guards are not armed. So people are thinking that armed guards made it go up 95%. Oh, gotcha. it, it's not armed guards. Actually, this line, this line item that we're talking about, you and I right now, is regular guards that were in one line and we broke it out now. Right. Yes, and that's because Correct. we have two different reporting documents that we have to provide. Right. right, and that's, I just wanted to make that clear to the public because, you know, you look on this document and it says, you, we have the percentage change. So people see that and they start to freak out a little bit, but it, it's not about armed guards, that, that line in particular, that is because we broke it out, simply. Correct? Yeah. Okay. My last question, and this is, you, you mentioned this tonight, so I'm, I didn't have this question written down before this. Um, you were talking about the borrowing of the money um, in October, which gives us a year for the construction work. Yeah. Um, what about the, the bond that we had? That has, why are we borrowing more money if we have a bond? Am I getting something so, wrong here? Did I not understand? Yes, you're confused. No, I think that... This is the only thing that I haven't put into that document yet uh, okay. and haven't shared in, in emails. Google, Google Doc is a little bit strange. You can't really add tabs and tables so, so well. So yeah, I'm working I know. on that. I, just, yeah. I, I appreciate I need you doing more that time though. to do that. So okay. we have a whole debt service schedule. So uh, a bond that we went for in 2018 that we refunded a uh, 2018 bond that replaced a van, an EPC from 2013, a 2011 project refunded from a 2003 project. All of those are part of our debt service schedule. And that grand total number of 9.3 is also something that goes into the tax levy calculation. Right, I so know with that. that. That whole 9.3 is also a part of the 9,000 series on that last page of the line by line. So if you go to the the 9711 series, okay. the, the function code 9711, that grand total is for okay. all principal and interest payments per that debt schedule. Okay. Now, no, no, and, and, again, lines, you just mentioned that tonight. So I just wanted you to clarify that because I was I, I said, wait, if we have a bond, why are yes. we borrowing more money? But now, now I get it. Okay, I appreciate so, that. So two other points on this. There, If you go a couple more lines down to 9785, that function code, that is the principal EPC for that 2013 project. Okay. And that EPC is 978,000, which that also ties into our debt service schedule. 978,343, yes. Okay, gotcha. 
Okay. I think you said no, one more thing that, that I didn't touch said, on. I was like, wait, we're borrowing more money? Who said that? Oh, so, okay. okay. Now I understand. So the, the final yeah. point is there's a 2009 project. It was $19.5 million. And our final payment will be coming off the schedule in June of 2021. The final payment we will make is $1.9 million. Right. So, that's so we have to replace... We have to replace that debt. This way, everything stays status quo and nothing gets gets weird. Now, because well, SE, let's let's, SE, let's explore that for a minute. You're saying that we have to replace that debt. We don't have to replace that debt. Typically, school districts do to keep everything status quo and to keep building going yes. and keep school aid coming in. Yep. But if we're in a really bad financial bind based on Cuomo, we don't have to replace that debt. We can actually not make that payment and, and save the money. It's like paying a mortgage so you can save the money on the taxes, on the interest, you know, on your taxes. So, yes. And what I was saying before okay. is that because of everything with coronavirus and Governor Cuomo, right. we, we cannot know borrow until that. we have FED approval. So since right. FED is delayed in their approval process, it wouldn't be until October that we could possibly get that approval. And we right. cannot go out and borrow. Unistat, our financial advisor, will not allow that per law until okay. we have that FED approval. So yep, typically yep. it's a year after you borrow that you owe your first payment. So it wouldn't be until October, 2021, which is a part of the 21, 22 school year. Okay. So that makes more sense. Does that clarify? I mean, and again, I, I was kind of not, I, I had something else going on when that was going on. That's why I questioned you about it. So yeah, I mean, once you give me those, uh, you know, I'll look at those financials and those other papers that you just talked about and the transfers. And then by, I'll, I'll spend the weekend on it. By next week, we can do the line by lines if you want, if you have time. But I think, I think you don't, I don't think you really need me. You know the numbers that we could tighten up. You could look back and see the numbers. They're all there. Yes. You know, and again, I gave you an example with round numbers, but there's lots of lines like that where we didn't expense even close to what we've been budgeting. Well, can we, this is a question. Can we lower the, the armed guards, lower it to 400? We yeah. can do whatever the board wants to do. Um, yeah. That will give you, you know, that'll give you twenty thousand dollars for any events that would be after school that that Don may see the need to well, put that's the if, guard there. That's if all goes well with school opening, school not having different shifts, school not. There's a lot of things that we don't know yet. If how much of security we're going to need when school opens, in regards to. I hope we have sports, but who knows? If they're talking about keeping this closed until until July or August, I'm just saying it's right now. It's there's a lot of uncertainty of what's gonna gonna happen going forward. I would budget less, knowing that that even that is gonna be we have savings in the security lines to begin with. So if we will move it down, there'll still be a cushion there. They will. And that, if that's what the board wants to do, we can certainly cut $100,000 out of those lines. It's not going to show Jackie as $100,000 coming out of one line because it will it has to go through to the different No, it'll buildings. be like 10000 out of each. I understand. Right, right. And if that's the board, what the board wants to do, so I just need, you know, three of you to tell me you want to do that, and we can, we can certainly do that. So that means that we have no intention of giving those... That means we have no intention of giving any guys raises. So that 500 is not part of, so that's a separate line item, but the security guards have been making a, um, uh, uh, they, they've been at a standstill for a few years now making $20 an hour. So I was saying that we have no intention of giving them any kind of raise in the future. I actually believe, uh, Mylon, that they make twenty-two fifty. Oh, I'm sorry, twenty-two fifty. Yeah. Listen, do. we can't. Let's, I don't know if we could discuss that in public, in public session. But with all the raises we've given across the board, I think it's something we should revisit in executive. You can discuss salaries in public. Okay. Well then. In all fairness, just not a particular had, people. You can't no, say a person's name. Listen right. to me, okay. In all fairness, we've had, we have had somebody like and and Reza, you could correct me if I'm wrong, come to us about other bargaining units. 
but because we have a unit that is humble and doesn't come to us and ask for more, doesn't mean we should take advantage of them. They go out of their way for our kids. They go out of our way. And if God forbid something happens, these are who are going to take the bullet for your kids. Sorry to say, but we they deserve for us to be looking into what their raises should be, considering we've given raises to top heavy administration. That's one. Two, if you do the numbers, Mylon, I know you go with numbers, it would be 400 hours of overtime, okay, to get to pass that cushion on armed guards. 400 hours. Show me 400 hours of overtime we're going to have in a school year. 400 hours. So, it's a lot of cushion. And honestly, I, this is my first budget on this side of the board table, but a lot of these lines are padded or cushioned too much by administration. And I know Bridget's new, and Bridget, thank you so much for answering all our questions in that very thick paperwork. I, I loved it because it's, it was easy read for me simple Simon terms, I appreciate it. But the reality is there is money in here. And in, in reality, we should lower it because I, I do not believe we're gonna go over it. And I think we should revisit if we've given raises to other, other units, which we have, I'm surprised that resident bring that unit up because every other unit he brought up. The problem is, if, I, if I'm correct in my thinking, is that they were capped at 30. They were already making the 30. So um, Reza, are they, is the cap been lifted to 35? The cap was lifted to 35. Yes. Right. Yes. So, so that's, pretty, that's pretty much why they were at a standstill for quite a while. So when you have to think about it, they, the-, the they My Lynn, three years is more than a standstill. Three years, and we have people who come and want to raise every year. Three years is a long time to not show support and a raise to people who are putting their lives out there to, to really hmm. to protect our kids. I have kids what? in elementary and middle school, and I have family members in the high school. Not for nothing, but me as a parent, not just as a board member, I'm telling you, these are people who are good to our children. Go to the elementary schools, go to the middle schools, ask. They're the ones who let our kids in and out. It's it's just the right thing to do. Ressa, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe this these uh, the security isn't part of a unit. No, they're not. Uh, that's correct. So the other piece too is that for the last couple of years, you know, I've always encouraged people to write, to write to your local congressmen and your local legislators and senators, anybody you can write to, if they can increase the cap of the 30. Now it's 35, but I still don't even think that's enough. The cap honestly should have been at 40, to be fair. So you can't, you, you know, yes, in previous years would have been nice to give them a raise, but then you're cutting manpower down because if you they, they were maxed at a 30, that means that, and you gave them a raise, it makes it uh, difficult for Don to do his job because he's got to rotate these men to, you know, because 30 goes pretty quick, $30,000 over 12 months. So that was the other position that was put in on to us. Yeah, people should write and have uh, that cap increased. But Mylon, that's not, not for nothing, but that's, and, and please don't take this the wrong way, but that should not be any reflection of a raise that we give. We gave raises to top heavy administration, but we're not giving raises to the, to the people on the ground. Jackie, Those that's are the not, people that we should be giving raises to as well. Jackie, and, that's not Jackie. That's not what I said. The, the the point is, is that they work eight hour days at the twenty two fifty. You times it by five days a week, and then over the course of time, it was making it difficult. And yes, but then he has somebody. He has to have somebody come in. And they more have people. to. They have to be somebody who, like like right now, even if it was thirty five, even if you moved it to forty, not for nothing, but you may still only get a security guard in a school for let's say maybe 15, 20 days of the month. After that, you might have to bring in a substitute. 
but we do that's that now. Just how it is, and that's what he does do already. So if you had yeah, to do, do that, that a few more days, I still don't think that saying to somebody the reason you're not getting a raise is because the because of what's going on with your cat. That's not that's that's not something we should be saying. We should be saying what is the right thing. We we gave raises across the board. You know, it could be you do something reasonable. You don't do something extravagant, but reasonable. Three well, years then without a raise. Well, then, well, then don't take out the hundred thousand dollars because this way there'll be money in there for raises. That's the point I was trying to make. Don't take out the hundred. Leave some money in there so that they can get a raise. That's what so I was advocating for. If you if you will let us know what you want us to calculate out and see what the cost would be, tell tell us what you're, what you're thinking. Right now they make twenty two fifty an hour. If you want us to calculate out twenty three fifty an hour, you want to calculate out twenty five dollars an hour. I don't know. Whatever you guys decide, we can certainly tell you what the the difference in the budget would be. Yeah, and that's the point I was trying to make. If you could put, if you can leave a hundred in. And My the point is, I just don't want it to. I don't want every single time we add money, we say it's for arm and guards. If we're giving a security guard who's unarmed, no part of the money raise, would be. No, wait, if we're giving an unarmed security guard a raise, that is completely a separate issue from arming guards. It's something that unfortunately we haven't done a good job with letting the community really grasp and understand. We haven't done a good job because if we did, people wouldn't think armed guards was a million dollars. But if we did give, give them the stats and the real numbers, they'd understand them. So, if we're giving somebody I think a raise, tonight, Jackie, we're I think all the questions that we have tonight. Security a raise. Why would we put that in the arming guards' money? Doesn't make I, and, sense. And again, well, I don't. One I, I'm, line. Looking, I'm looking at it as a security as a whole. I'm incorporating your on your armed and your unarmed as one in my mind as one total. So if you're going to take off a hundred thousand dollars. I'm well, assuming. then move the hundred to a different line item in the security for salaries. I wouldn't say it's for arming guards. Because well, now what it you're is, saying now is, it is broken out, right, Linda? If, if, uh, we, if we, we took armed not... guards off and we gave people a raise, it was still let Linda tell you the answer. That Jackie, there, let Linda. Those two costs are combined on the salary line for security. Because of the way we report to the state with, with every building having its own its own little budget that we have to do for our transparency, the salary line is conjoined. It doesn't matter if you're paying a, an armed guard or an unarmed guard. And one of the reasons that we were doing that was so that the public wouldn't see how we were deploying. That it's, was, that, the, point, that, that was that the point was, I was trying to make to Jackie. It's so, all together. <laughs> It's all on the same line. It's, you know, Cherokee security salaries, and it's there. You know, uh, Duffield security salaries, and both the, all security for that building is in that line. Well, here's the thing. You guys put an increase on every line for armed guards, though. So if you're going to increase it, then the increase shouldn't be included like that. Because what I'm saying to you is if we're giving people a raise, if you say, we're not going to do armed guards. We're going to do just regular security guards, and we're giving them a raise. The line's going to increase, but you're not going to put the increase 95% armed guards. What I'm saying yeah. is you're not being transparent to the actual voter or to the actual community member. You're not. That's what the increase was for, though, was to, to give the, the change from the $22.50 an hour to $45 an hour. So the explanation on the line was the increase is happening because the salary went up because the <coughs> guards that are armed are getting paid $45 an hour. I don't know how that's not transparent. Well, because what I'm saying to you is if you have 500000 allocated for arming guards, okay, it's for arming guards. Those are our armed guards, not our, our security guards who are unarmed. So if we have unarmed security, that should not be together. You're telling a voter that we're increasing the budget by 500,000 for armed guards. When in reality, some of that is 100,000 or more is salary increase for unarmed security. 
Well, if we if you decide to do that, yes. If you decide to do that, the line would say increase in salary as well. But it's increase in unarmed security, correct? It's increased for both, Jackie. So when we when you looked at originally, <laughs> when you look at it originally, two guards in Cherokee, and they were both making twenty two fifty an hour. Now it's potentially one guard at twenty two fifty dollars an hour and twenty and one guard at forty five dollars an hour. That increase, which is on that same salary line, is because of the additional cost for the arming. And that's how we explained it. You want us to explain it differently? We can certainly explain it differently. It's, it's the differential between the 2250 original salary and the $45 salary for the armed guards. That's the difference in the salary line. Right, I would prefer for transparency, for, the, for people who just look at the budget fast, for them to understand what armed guards cost. What is the difference between armed, arming our guards and regular security. Well, I'd like to make a motion to put up a billboard vote. I would like somebody to vote on a billboard. I'll put, the bill, put, I'll put a billboard. <laughs> I'm for the billboard. That's sorry. But with the, but with the, true, <laughs> Mark, with no. the true amount. With the true amount. Not with the unarmed security. I'm serious security about making a motion to, to vote for that, by the way. One. So nobody knows what the real number is, which is like 250,000, 300,000. And nobody sees it because we're putting in the the unarmed security with it. Along with the, I see what you're saying. You're putting in, in the, the resistance for the unarmed as well as the, the security. In the budget brochure, will you be putting $380,000 for armed guards? That's what the figure is going to be. And there'll be no overtime. That's what I'm hearing, right? So in the in the budget brochure, you're going to show in well, the $380,000. Hey, we could put. I don't think Lee, there's going could to be a twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, I don't think cushion. so either. You could do 400, 400 hours of overtime would be you could get in there. It would be a big amount of overtime to, to make up twenty thousand dollars. Okay, so what you're asking, Jackie, is for us to separate out the salary line for the code 1650-169 for security that's going to be armed versus unarmed for each building, which is going to show a decrease in, this, in the unarmed, which is going to be offset by the cost increase for the armed. Is that what you're asking us to do? Yes, I want that. people to see the true numbers. People okay. have been asking me all over social media, there's so much fictitious numbers going around. People don't see the real numbers. The real Jackie, numbers in I, a almost two hundred million dollar budget. Yes. When something is less than three hundred thousand dollars to protect our children, I want people to know true numbers. Three hundred thousand in a two hundred million dollar budget. It's, it's a big nut. It's not a big nut. You're correct. I just want to add that the the reason I'm asking about all these tightening up all these numbers is because. This pandemic has caused havoc in everyone's lives, and we know our children are going to need more mental health. So we know that we're going to need to increase those lines to cover the cost of more YFS workers, more social workers, more psychologists, and that kind of thing. So for me, I know that that expense is going to come when and if our kids get back to school sometime this year. So that's why I want to really tighten up this budget so that we have that money for those kids. Well, I have a question. That, that brings back a question, Eileen. Good job. I just forgot. When I was looking at numbers, there was a number that came in in regards to homeless children. They came, the numbers that came in it used to be years ago, very low in like the 150 to 200,000. We're up to like 600,000. Does that do anything for our budget in regards to helping with uh, allocating money towards it. So our homeless population has gone up significantly. Um, that's out of Ms. Santo's office and she's very tight with the budget with that. Um, since I've arrived, I wanna say it's tripled. So in about six years, our, our amount of kids who are homeless has tripled. And as you know, Ms. Santo in her, in her presentation earlier today, 
spoke about kids who we have to pick up all the way in Queens because there's a 50 mile radius uh, that is legally the district's responsibility to bring kids from. Um, and that transportation costs a lot of money. Uh, that to cut that line right now, I think would be very would not be in the no, best. No, no, no. You're budget. misunderstanding. I'm not looking to cut the line at all. I'm actually looking to add. I was I wanted to add somebody who is just, even if it's just clerical, somebody who is just dealing with our homeless population, so that they get the 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 special care and needs met because it's tripled. It's triple, but we haven't added any clerical to handle it. We have we have uh, a clerical whose responsibility is the homeless. She's the homeless liaison. And that's the only thing she handles. Um, I would have to look at the rest of her job responsibilities, but that's a that's a large bulk of her job. Okay, can you can you advise us on that? Because my understanding is that there's they, they do more than just that. And I think we need somebody who's just doing just that for right now. Okay, I can look at what, what that person's other job responsibilities are. And I know me and Eileen talked about looking into adding to YFS if we needed. That's something, especially after this pandemic, that was something we wanted to look into. If there was any needs there. Well, that's why I know we're going to need that. So that's why I think we really need to tighten up this budget so that there's money there. We need to make sure that we have it as tight as possible so that we can add, if we need to add that line, we can add that line. I mean, we're very fortunate that, that Ms. Santos has the money from last year to bring over for that initiative. She went over that initiative with me. I was, I was lucky to be able to sit down with her and, and look it over and it's, it's exceptional. And I think it'll help a lot of kids and a lot of families, which is, is a wonderful thing. Um, I, I do think it would be it would be great if we could, you know, maybe ask her down the road or see if they if they need any any staffing, any help in there, because that's going to be where we're going to truly get hit hard. I agree with that. Any other uh, budget questions? No, I think I'm done. I, I, you know, Bridget knows what, what I want, so I'm, I'm pretty much done. Oh, I do have one more question. Sorry, I just turned my page over and saw the last one. Um, school lunch fund. Um, we typically under budget that expense, and then we always have to make a transfer in, and we have a line for a transfer. Can you explain yes. why we under budget that when we know we have to transfer money every single year? That really has to do with year end and when they close out the books and we get audited. So for this, this year in close, the school lunch did not include an adjustment that was made on the financials of 171,000. So that has to be on top of the transfer for 2021. So I know that a question that has come back a couple times around from the board is whether or not we could adjust that transfer to school lunch. And the answer is no, because of that $171,000 adjustment. No, that's not what I mean though, Bridget. Maybe I didn't explain it right. Uh, we, we have a, I don't know where the line is for the school lunch fund. Say it's $200,000. Every year we under budget that line because we always have to transfer money in. Always, there's right, always an adjustment. We always have, so why do we under budget that? What's the reasoning for that? I mean, so, that's showing, you know, we it, still have to make a transfer. So the money's going to go there. So why don't we just budget it the proper way? So people know how much the loan program is. And this year, and we that's why I $30,000. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't hear either one of you because you, you talked. I, I thought it, it sounded like both of you were talking over each other. This is budgeted appropriately this year at about $430,000. Okay, it is. I didn't see the line. I just saw the transfer. It's so that's what made me remember it. Page, page 16. Yeah, that's what reminded me of it. Yeah, it's well, it's it's $430,000, which is much so, more appropriate than what it's been budgeted. So, yeah, so Linda, that means I'm sure we'll probably still have to do a transfer in, but it won't be as large as normal. Is that what I'm, you're saying? Or, or we won't have to do a transfer? Tight. I'm thinking we're pretty okay. tight. Okay, good. All right. 
Because we do under budget. Well, in years past, we have under budgeted that. Yes, um, different different business official. Right. I gotcha. Okay, good. All right, that's it. I'm I'm freaking done. Okay, is uh, all questions been answered by the board? Yep. Okay, so we're moving on to the. Um, oh, I, we got more stuff. I move. I added on to new discussion items. Um, another third item which is um, we had abolished um, quite a few positions last week, I'm sorry, last board meeting. And I just wanted to have a consideration of the board to maybe reconsider four positions. The four that I'm speaking about is the AP at the high school, um, the assistant superintendent for curriculum, the assistant superintendent for special education and the head of guidance. <clears throat> I thought I thought we got guidance from the legal department that you can't ask for that consideration because you weren't the majority vote. Right. Well, we got, well, he said we can have a discussion. So uh, the reason why I wanted to bring it up was because of that 1.8 that was suddenly, like some of you had said, it fell out of the tree. Um, well, it I fell out of the sky after positions were abolished. And and I'm Mylan, I'm not saying that against you because you've been excellent with finding money, just going line by line. But that's my point. And Bridget's been doing an awesome job. That's not even the issue. The issue is that there is some that seem to put money in the budget or but or say that this is what something's gonna cost, and then all of a sudden we abolish positions and it is money falling out of the sky. When I'm getting phone calls a day later saying, Jackie, guess what? This is what was found. Jackie, guess what? We, we can bring back this or that. There was a reason why we looked into to, to, to getting rid of top heavy administration. It had nothing to do with the person. It had to do with the positions. The positions are not in every school district and certainly not in school districts that are our size. If you, if you went through Suffolk and Nassau County, there are, there are not all assistant supers and then directors, and then it's just not like that. In other districts, we have assistants to assistants to assistants, and we do have that. And a lot of positions that are made up, and then a year later, we get rid of them. We don't have, we only have one assistant superintendent for curriculum. We have no director under him. So the bottom line is that well, Lee, I what my is asking is for one of the majority votes. Administration Jackie. told me that if Jackie. the position went vacant, that the director could handle it with a stipend. Which that's director? That's what I was told. Now, again, I'm newly, but that's what I was told. And my ears are, are, are very well. I know what I heard. And there's a lot of things this community could say about me. I, I don't know. They're not everybody likes me. I get that. But most people respect that I tell the truth. Okay. And the truth is, administration told me something. And that might be their error. Well, I just know so, it's so the bottom line is that Mylin is asking for consideration for well, a revote. Well, I was also wanted to try to put a pitch out there. And again, I want to just tap on the fact that we've been speaking about having a COVID um, a, a pandemic and that we worry about our children in crisis, you know, in particular to our most vulnerable children um, from K to 12. And I just feel that we need as many hands on deck to, 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 to go into this next year. And even well, let me ask you something, Mylin. If that's the case, how come we're not looking at our most vulnerable, our elementary schools? We took away assistant principals from Sycamore and Cherokee. That's where we took away assistant principals. We're talking about our most vulnerable, as if only in the middle school and high school have special education and special needs. Well, Jackie, I hate to tell Jackie, everybody, but elementary Jackie, schools Jackie, have I am, a lot of children that are undiagnosed or on the spectrum. And Jackie, we took those positions away and they're not being, maybe those should be put back on. Well, Jackie, I am not the one to put the six people, I'm sorry, the six um, just uh, job titles on there. I did abstain on the um, Cherokee vote. And I'll tell you why I abstained, because if everybody's saying that the high school can work with two APs and one principal and 
that's fine. But uh, but the, the elementary school that has 500, you, you, you know, you have to balance. You have to be fair and equitable. You can't sit there and have 1,800 students. Exactly. So if we're not going to put an assistant principal in an elementary school that's the size of a middle school, then the high school will do fine with the two with two assistant principals. And there are other options that we can discuss. There are other options. It doesn't have to be that there's no other help there. It just doesn't have to be an assistant principal position. Just like it doesn't have to be a dean's position. There can be other positions. Our, our superintendent herself said that there could be other positions. Well, the thing is we, cut one position from Cherokee, there has been three positions cut from the high school. You know, so you, you're, the, the administration in that building is drastically changed. And you, you know, and we worry about how our kids are gonna come back to school. You know, I could tell you right now, there, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of depression out there. Educationally, there's gonna be a lot of regression. So how do you want a, a, a an interim principal to handle those situations, handle parents. Listen, our interim principal that went into that high school did a fabulous job. That interim principal, uh, assistant principal that went in there, we have an interim principal and an interim assistant principal that are both doing an excellent job. Excellent. If if you're saying, look at, look at how it went this year. I'm not saying that we don't necessarily need additional APs in the future. I'm just saying right now, it's something that I would revisit again in the future. Not right now. That and was then, my point to you guys. That's right. just me. All right. So I'm going to get play out a scenario for you. I don't know the dates offhand. I, I, you know, say God willing, we go back to school. I don't know. Say September 2nd, September 3rd, a fight breaks out. We don't, we abolish that position. So what happened? Okay, is, wait, wait, let's go back. Jackie, Jackie can Fight I finish? Broke Jackie, down Jackie, here. Jackie, you need, Jackie, 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 you need, Jackie, Jackie, you need, Jackie, you need to let me finish, Jackie. Go ahead. So, so September 3rd, there's a fight that breaks out, right? What is it now? What we have to do is now we have to create the position. Now we have to have a hiring committee. That process can take about six weeks. In the meantime, you're leaving the school vulnerable by having just uh, two, three administrators at the, at the thing, at the high school, where we're now searching for our next assistant principal. It, it is a process. It's not like September 3rd, there's a fight, September 4th, that we can miraculously put an AP and approve them on the board uh, agenda. Well, well, I was told that there was other avenues we could look into, which were, which were having a disciplinary specialist or something along those lines that walks the hallways. There's other options. So my thoughts and that, that these were thoughts that were told to me by administration is that we can do something like that. I would never want to leave an interim principal with, with heavy without anybody to help him. I don't want that. And I certainly don't want any kids to ever get hurt. As it was, we had a fully staffed administration had this fight in the high school going on for the last two years and I've gotten videotapes of them so not for nothing I know you know because I've sent them to you and the super and said what is this so even with four people if you have the right two people the job will get done you could you have know. four positions you could have four positions and if you don't have Four people are in the hallways or doing whatever. Is it going to matter? A fight can break out still because they can't be everywhere all the time. Isn't that what everybody tells me? And you know what? And if you want to make comparisons, that was under a different regime. We have a new regime now and we're not giving this new regime the opportunity. It's, to it's not a fully different regime. That's one. Two, I'm not saying anything against the regime. What I'm saying to you is there are other options that, that can play out. Any other I, options I heard from our very own administration here on in the cabinet that we could do a disciplinary, I think it was a disciplinary specialist if it was a teacher. So if you had a teacher step up, there you go. So either way, I'm just saying to you, 
I'm not against adding an AP, but I'm also, you can't keep saying our most vulnerable because our most vulnerable are the young children that really can't speak for themselves, that really don't show. The, when we do threat assessment, there is no real threat assessment that works as well with middle school and high school kids as it does with younger kids. Because the younger kids, you have to really sit down with them and play with them and see what's really going on. And they don't want to get mommy and daddy in trouble or they don't want to get whatever's going, their friends in trouble. It's a lot different. So you can't say to me that our most vulnerable aren't elementary school kids either because they are. And we're not looking, we're not looking, you only put four positions back up for discussion. What does that tell me? If that was I'm, the case, they all should have went up for discussion. What I'm advocating for is that we're moving into a new normal. We don't know what their new normal is going to look like. So why sit there and have an understaff? And, and then if, God forbid, something goes wrong, who is to blame for at that point? Oh, well, the three that was there, they weren't paying attention. In the meantime, now you still have to go through a vetting process that can take weeks before you now make the, uh, you do the job posting and then it closes in a week and then you have to have the committee and stuff like that. You can't have a fight on September 3rd and think instantly that there's gonna be somebody in there September 4th. It doesn't work like that. And I don't wanna sit there and start a new year where our children are going to be, they're gonna be a higher rates of depression, higher rates of anxiety, higher rates of regression and education. So we should bring in mental health staff because it isn't the AP who's meant, they're not psychologists, they're, they're assistant principals. It's an assistant principal position. Why don't we go to bring in a mental on health school? staff? Jackie, let me just pick one second. Or a psychologist, I'm 100% for that. The fights that go on, the house, on in the high school, even if there's 15 APs, they might not be in that hallway where the fight is. Half the times it's the teachers breaking up the fights, not the APs. You, the APs can't always be, even, I, I don't care if there's 15 of them. You can't be in every spot in the high school if a fight breaks out, my Lynn. So that, that argument is, is kind of not the, great, the greatest one that you can make. But I just want to throw that out there. Usually the teachers break up the fights. Yeah, but the, the know, thing is, but the, but don't the APs don't the APs uh, they do evaluations? They do all of that. I'm just bringing up one little tiny piece of a day that can go wrong and set your day off. They they their responsibilities are wide and great, and two two APs cannot handle all of all of the responsibilities of, of the school district that that houses. I think you're underestimating our APs. And our new principal there is doing a fabulous job, and I think we're all underestimating him. And that's no, I'm not underestimating. He's doing a great job. So let's just... ask Linda, Dr. Adams. What is our other options? There's there's other models in other districts that could be used. The biggest issue is going to be that our teachers have never been asked to do discipline as a dean. Uh, it was something I actually spoke to um, Mr. Moran about uh, when, when, when the cut was made, we had a conversation, he and I, and I said, well, how, how can we fill in some of these spots? Have we ever as a district asked a teacher to, instead of doing a duty sitting in the hallway, doing a duty, doing the light discipline issues? Because Mylon is speaking about a fight, which is honestly very rare at Connectquat High School. Um, they happen more often in, in other places. What APs actually do a lot of is more light discipline. Like, why is a kid cutting? So, uh, Jack, you said earlier, you know, put more mental health professionals in there. APs actually do a lot of relationship making and discussions about decisions that kids make because they do talk to all the kids who are absencing themselves frequently. They do talk to all the kids who are cutting classes um, they do talk to kids who get themselves into, into making bad decisions. So they do actually a lot of boots on the ground kind of work dealing with children. So I had a conversation with Mr. Moran to say, how can we take care of this in light of the fact that you are now going to, have to be down two APs? Because last year we cut another AP. So this, the, the, the school has gone from six administrators to three administrators within the last two years. 
So we were having a discussion piece and he looked and talked to some people and we have never asked for the, the teachers to do discipline as um, something that is uh, part of their, their school day. So it would be a discussion that would have to be had with the, with the CTA, um, with the president, to see if that would be something that we could ask teachers to do as part of their duty. So but wouldn't, um, that be a, wouldn't that be a good thing considering if we have if we have teachers and I don't know for sure, but if we have any and there and the CTA is okay with it, that if we have any, that's one way to save teachers outside of uh, of attrition of them retiring. Isn't it? Isn't that a, not, a way to keep a teacher in the district who may want to move up and be administration someday? Yeah, it would be a discussion that would have to happen. The only other question that I would have would be a legal question because it's unit work moving from the administrative unit to the teacher unit. So I don't know if that would, if that would even be able to, to be done moving that, that work from one unit to another. So I'm gonna have to ask legal. Yeah, yeah we're, gonna be, we're gonna be back to square one, having an AP, but now it's gonna be disguised as another name. Yes, you might get uh, some push, but you we would likely will get pushed back with regard to unit work being transferred from uh, one unit to another. So Absolutely. Would, it's got, now we're going back to an AP again. Well, worst case scenario, there's always the choice of having an interim, like we had the interim this year. It wasn't a bad thing. The interim actually, from, my, from what I've heard throughout the high school, put some serious discipline in there for the children who in the first week of school, people were writing on, on social media and parents were jumping in to say how happy they were. They were happy. Hundreds and hundreds of comments about how happy they were to see an assistant principal in a hallway walking up and down and being disciplined. And being yeah, but you, just very, got, you just got rid of that, Jackie. So what is the word? Well, I didn't get rid of that because I haven't seen that in years in the high school. I haven't seen that in years. You brought back somebody from when I was in school and that's when discipline came back. You but can't you got, guarantee that. You got rid of the two. You can put two APs in there. But if you get one like that, you don't need to. But you still, so what are you saying? So we, we had the three and then we actually had, we had three APs, we had a Dean. Now we only have two APs no, and, and no Dean. So how do you how do you cut it? And first off, the other thing is too, we never even asked or gave the courtesy to the principal to say, "Hey, how would you feel? We're going to cut your staff in half." We never even gave that respect. We just did it. So uh, you know, we 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 took the responsibility well, the out of the principal's checked, hand, we and we we didn't cut everybody. The last time I checked, the dean's position and the guidance position were put on the budget by the cabinet, by administration. The same positions that you talk about bringing back one was no, one no, 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 no. Well, the one I brought, the one I was recommending to bring back was the head of guidance, because I think that goes hand in hand with the YFS workers. And I would, I would hope that Linda could speak to that more thoroughly about what his job responsibility is. Um, but you, you just don't know what September is going to bring. And we're removing hands on deck with really being involved with our kids. So you're, you're right, Jackie. Our recommendation was to, uh, to half-time abolish the director of guidance and half-time abolish an AP and have the person who is currently dealing, who is currently in the director of guidance position, take over the half AP and continue to do the work district-wide as the director of guidance. So that was on one of our uh, recommendation forms of the things that we thought should, should be cut when we needed to cut the budget before, um, before COVID it interceded and didn't let us do some of the projects that we thought we would get done. Um, but it was, it was more along the lines of continuing the mental health profession because he is a guidance counselor. So when we say our APs don't do that kind of work, well, this AP would be able to do that kind of work. He'd be able to counsel kids. He'd also fulfill the SED regulation of having guidance available K-12, 
which is why the position was created two years ago when the SED guidance be, it came out. Um, that was something that was answered in, um, in, in the document that's online that was given to all the board uh, that, that spoke about the fact that we're mandated to have someone oversee the guidance service K-12, and that's why that position was originally created two years ago. Um, so the, the, when, when we were looking to make those cuts, we said, since there is no one currently in the position of AP, if you cut half an AP and allowed Mr. Macaluso to kind of straddle both worlds, he would be able to do some, some guidance work and he would also be able to do some AP work and bring that skill set, which is more of a mental health view, because a lot of discipline issues happen because kids are having some mental health challenges. So we thought that would be a nice way to make sure that the high school had what it needed and made sure that the district met the state regulations of having that oversight K-12 and guidance. And that is why that was put as a cut, that one position was put, it's kind of an abolishment of half and half. You put, so, that, as a, you put that as a recommendation, if that recommendation doesn't pass, what do you do in terms of the guidance department when, the, when you have to have an administrator oversee it? Um, I don't know. I would probably have to hire multiple guidance counselors to go from building to building to building. Um, I don't know. It's something I haven't thought all the way through because the cuts um, were very different than when, what, I actually wasn't ever act, actually asked for a recommendation. Um, and the cuts that we made were, the cuts that the board made were not things that I would have advised. There were- Right, but know, here's the bottom line, and, and then I'm gonna be done with this conversation. The bottom line is we got blasted with a list of like 40 teachers, a million custodians, uh, all across the board cuts from the lower level people. And for me, that just was not going to happen. And, and we were blindsided on that, which was really horrible. So we decided if you want to do, you want to make cuts all across the board, we're going to start from the top. That's the bottom line. The vote went through. I'm not, I already told you that I'm not going to, um, um, uh, What's the word to revote? I'm not doing the revote. So, uh, yeah, if Jackie my, or Mark, I'm done talking about this though. I've had enough. Okay. I want, I'm ready to move on. It's getting very late. Okay. We have a lot more to discuss. Well, so I, I just wanted to say this. I wanted to know. Um, no, what was happening what you, is you're spending you, three hours trying to trying to change our what minds, you, and I we just said it like three times that we're not going to do that. But and you just keep we keep discussing it. And now we're on the. We're on this phone call for you know for hours about a vote well, that already happened. Well, you would you you made the vote happen without discussing, without even asking what the ramifications would be. That you could, you voted no. You did your vote. That four. Everyone else did their vote. Any, now, now you're I was not going to cut forty teachers, Lee. I don't know about you I, and why we you were, were okay with that list. One. Lee, you I was not okay with that list like you were. You can be okay with cutting 40 teachers. I'm not. I'm done with this conversation. Okay. I'm, yeah, done with I'm, it not, now. I'm not revoting. I'm talking now, that Jackie. Teachers, you had this conversation. I was I never for March 10th. We were blindsided because we never even knew that teachers were told. So now you upset teachers. You made kids upset because kids in the high school showed up at our meeting. We had a few that were in tears because they don't want to lose their beloved teachers. But, but you had no problem with that, Lee, what they did to us. We didn't know that that was coming down the pipeline. And yet here we are not cutting 43 teachers. So why did administration think it was okay to put that out there? Why? Well, administration was wrong in putting it out there without even discussing with us. But also, administration never put any any teacher on the chopping block when they put this together forward. That's not true. All those oh. teachers came well, together. Yeah, I, got a list. Teachers. I got a list. I had a list. You you want me to send it to you? Because I have it in the paperwork. A list. Exactly who they were going for. And it was all lower level people. People who, it didn't make sense. You're going after the sm the, the smaller jobs, the, the less expensive salaries it just was it's it's just the wrong way and i said it at the meeting on march 10th i was very clear nothing was put on the table you start from the top 
You want to cut, you start from the top. And well, by you know the what? way, you told me to listen. You told me to listen to administration, Lee. I listened. That's what I was told. Vacant position, don't got to refill it. Never had special ed assistant super, only had director. I was told many different things. I'm sorry you weren't in those conversations, but I was new and I guess people like to try to feed me things because they think I don't see through what they're telling me. Okay, now it's my turn. Maybe a list was sent out. The possibility of coach, you can cut 50 people. It all depends. You can cut, I mean, you wanna make class sizes 40 kids, you cut 60 people. There was no intent by anyone on this school board to raise class sizes. Okay, there was no intent for any one of us to say that. A, when, right, when so this, why was that list went out? When this, is, when this came up, every, any cut needed a, a, a ramification. Every cut, you start to say, okay, if you're going to cut this, you have to do this, do this, do that, do that. Right? We don't even have an alternative high school, anything. Uh, alternative Please, why did they send it Please, out? We didn't I'm cut the alternative high school. We didn't cut the alternative high school, school or the rap room. Children were crying Where did that come from? Meeting. That comes why we still we have it? That? Why would we, we didn't cut it, Lee. We did not cut that program. Thank you. you. You wanted to cut it. I didn't want to cut anything. I want to help kids. It's on the Don't say I wanted to cut it, Lee. Don't put words in my mouth. I never said it. I never said cut it. I'll pull it. You you said, how do you go about it? And Linda said to you, uh, I don't know why I'm even doing this. Linda said to you, you just have to take it out of the budget. You don't have, we don't have to have a vote on it. But I asked about like a whole saying... bunch of things about cutting things for the budget. Everything is in discussion at, at budget time. Everything Lee, is, is up like to grabs at budget time. Doesn't mean doing no it. We had a discussion about closing John Pearl. We didn't close John Pearl either. We no, can discuss everything without doing something, Lee. What are, your intent was, I have the emails. No, that, you don't about. know my intent, Lee. My intent is to emails. discuss. That's what my intent was. We discussed John Pearl. We discussed Lee, cutting time, programs. We, did, and we decided every that time teachers I talk, with the kids they were more important. That's well, don't know, Lee. You're bullying me. Lee, you're putting words in my mouth while you're campaigning. You don't even Stop know campaigning, Lee. I don't care about running again for the board. I care about what's doing right. You only I can't care you only kids. speak up when you're campaigning. Stop. But Lee, Stop. do you really say that we tried kids? to cut shit that we didn't try to cut? Wait, Eileen, hold on. I Eileen, said, can you I stop this? The board, They're bullying me. I again. came to the what? board this week saying that I no, wanted you're bullying to me and I feel very that we did I for graduates, that we did for kindergartners, that we did for fifth graders, that we did for eighth graders. And instead of you, Lee, jumping into the email and saying, Hey Jackie, great idea. You jumped in to tell me they're not graduates. They're just moving, they're moving up. up. They're not our seniors. Right. And today you went as far as to tell me that college kids are not getting a graduation. Are you kidding me? I don't care if these kids get graduate and walk in, in December. I want to see every high school senior get their diploma. I want to see every kindergartner first. I don't care if it's fifth grade rather eighth grade, whatever moving up, you call it moving up, I call it a graduation. They're graduating their school. They're graduating and going into first grade. They're graduating and going into sixth grade. It is something important to them. It is yeah. something important to them. It's a big family. deal to those kids. You know what? They worked hard. Why do you want to, to take away from there. kids? And not, I get it. I don't get so it. Really. Far gone. I the think problem, that I was taken away. Excuse me. My job to Excuse figure out me. what to do. Excuse me. We're getting off topic. I added this. I added this to the to the, the new discussion item. I want to hear from Linda what it, when we when we abolish the position for special education, what goes with that? Because are we losing the alternative high school? Are we losing the wrap room? Are we losing the cap program? What are we losing by by terminating that position? I want to you before to we hear from Linda. I just want to comment on that, Mylin. If we lose all those programs, that wasn't because the board cut them. That's, we have directors that have done this for years. There's no reason why directors can't still, do, can't still run those programs if they're You're, good programs. And the people uh, that are in those programs, if you don't have confidence in them to run it, 
with a director instead of an assistant superintendent, then that's a problem too. No, and now wait, we wait, have wait, the added wait, principal. Wait, 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 wait. I want to address Wait, Eileen, Eileen, Eileen. Wait, hold on. In that wait, in the Eileen. alternative high school, we now have Eileen. a principal. Are you telling me that a principal that was able to handle a school of that of over a thousand of what is it, two thousand, is now not able to handle a school of four kids? Come on, guys. First of all, you, what you guys are not uh, paying attention to is if you're going to add on more work or more responsibility to the members in that unit, they are going to grieve you. And what is that? Those you, members, is, a director already had that position and you took responsibilities away from that director <laughs> position to create this new position, the assistant superintendent title, which is a title that gives more money to, to do a job that you took duties away from a director to do. Yes, did they expand on it? Yes. Those duties can go right back to that director the way it was before. So this is a moot point. I am done no, talking it, about no, this. No, I'm it's not going to drag into this anymore. I'm done. And I just want to know something Wait, wait, else. wait. wait Why it's is not, there wait. so much corruption? You're going to tell me that, that our superintendent and our cabinet doesn't know the name of a position? I'm looking on this agenda and it's showing that we have to re-abolish the position because it wasn't said correctly? Well, I don't really and understand that, wait, that. That's the other problem. And everyone it tells was me said no correctly, and, and then Linda corrected up, the people. district clerk, wake and up. now it's back on the thing. So that needs to be explained. Wake up. I All right. Wait, 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 wait. There's corruption. All right, so let me go back to originally what I, yeah. what I was trying to put there. You, there was a director. I don't know how to change. Linda will have to explain that. There was programs now added on. So now you there's additional programs on that Monica Mancy brought in that were not here prior. So who is going to look over those new programs? Because now you're you're gonna delegate more. As children. I said earlier, our superintendent. Wait, Eileen, Eileen, that's our job that's Eileen, can I, Eileen, can I finish? Now you're you now, finish, but I'm tired of hearing about it. We voted. You, you want us to re vote. I, you you're not I helping did. us. You know what? I did not cut anybody off. I've been totally respectful this whole night. You're right. I you apologize, Mylan. You're right. I apologize. You know what? You need to let me finish. Everybody needs to let me finish. I, I just said up. I apologize. Go ahead. I apologize. You know what? I wouldn't be so passionate about something if I didn't think that it wasn't important. By removing certain support staff, those support staff help our teachers. I was never, when that list came out about the, uh, the extraordinary amount of teachers being excess, I was very, I was very thrown back by that. I, I, that was nothing I would ever support. So let's put that, I wanna just put that aside because I know that came up. Now that supposedly there's a little bit of monies that are found, these particular jobs that I'm trying to advocate for do help our children. They help support our teachers and we're going to need a lot of support going forward. That's all I'm asking. That's all I'm advocating for. It's the bottom line for me is about the kids. It's about getting our teachers, uh, uh, you know, if they have questions or they need guidance on something, there's somebody there directly that they need to speak to. The way we're leaving it off right now, let Linda figure it out. Let Linda figure it out. Well, what is Linda going to do? Have, have 600 teachers go to her for guidance because maybe for a particular situation or a program or anything else, we cut our district by curriculum. I mean, I've never even heard of, I, 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 we're in the business for education, but we cut the curriculum assistant and superintendent. I, I just, none of these things are making sense. Believe me, guys, I know where your hearts were. You, you wanted to make a, 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 an impact that was gonna be spread out across the district for everybody to feel the burn. But at that point in time, the only one that got the burn was the, the administrators. And now well, I'm the burn, was, the burn came for the children. Children are going to get the burn. And the only thing that I'm asking for is that because there's a little money in the district, I am worried about our kids coming back. And if we can get more people, more bodies to help our children. Now, Linda, I'm going to direct this question at you. By removing the assistant superintendent for special education, what are we losing? So I'm going to just correct a misconception that there was only a director to begin with. When I arrived in the district, there was an assistant to the superintendent that took care of uh, took care of uh, special education, and there were two chair people that took care of special education under that 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 person's supervision. 
Mrs. Manzi, as the assistant superintendent, is the only 12 month employee. So directors and principals are 11 month employees. They have 30 days off in the summer. They only have to work half the summer. So one of the biggest things is that special education is a 12 month program, which is probably why way back when there was an assistant superintendent position created because that person became a, co a contract all onto themselves and they became a 12 month employee. We have students in both our CAPS program and our ESY program that have 12 month education plans in their IEPs. So in order to have people supervise that, we will be paying people to supervise that over and above their regular salaries. We have a 4410 program. I know that Mrs. Kennedy asked for this information. That is our CAPS program. It is a special education program for kids who are two years, 10 months old to, to, to kids who are four, four years old. We are one of two districts on Long Island that have that. That's completely under Mrs. Manzi's supervision. She applies for the, the, the ability for us to have that through Suffolk County. Um, it is a tax burden. It is never fully paid for. That would be something that if we don't re reinstate that position that I would suggest the board look to abolish. If we abolish that, it is quite a few people um, that, that are teachers, that are um, TAs, that are aides, that are special speech pathologists who are part of that program that would be accessed as well um, because- And it hurts kids. It, 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 it is a great program, um, but most of the time kids from all other districts on Long Island except for one, and I wanna say that that's Harbor Fields, but I'm not sure, it's one of the Huntington districts. It's, it's a program that's run through Suffolk County. So kids would not be hurt because they would be in other situations. They wouldn't be in our school setting, but they would be at, at DDI or they would be at, um, at, at other places. But the oversight of that is, is Mrs. Manzi um, because that's a 12 month program. The oversight of the ESY program which is in two different buildings and has 70 children and potentially this year because we are in the situation that we are in, uh, with the COVID closures, we may have a, a double program for ESY because even though New York State Education Department has said that we do not have to give hour for hour compensatory education, we do have to provide kids with compensatory education to get them ready to come back to school in September if they have regressed so much because they are not having face-to-face -face education. So those two, those two programs are really a kind of up in the air without having the supervision and someone would have to be paid to supervise both those programs. Um, Mrs. Manzi brought back five students uh, into the alternative high school, which if that program were to go away, um, it would cost more money. That was part of her goal in bringing our kids back into being part of our district. Um, it was an extremely successful pilot which was put into the grant, which is something that Ms. Manzi has oversight and writes the grant. Um, so in the 611 grant, there was about $320,000 put in to run the alternative high school program. Um, if that were to be abolished, um, and, and quite frankly, Mrs. Manzi is the one who goes out to the BOCI centers, does the profile on our kids, follows our students, goes to the CSEs and see if there are other kids that can be brought back into the program because the programs out there run about $90,000 uh, in both and that doesn't even count the transportation. So for every person that Mrs. Manzi brings back from, from those programs into our program, we save our district about $100,000 with the lead transportation included. So within, if she brings back two people She's, we, we've almost reimbursed our sal her salary by bringing them back into the district. Um, uh, honestly, if we go down to one administrator, uh, the director, there are 100, 140 teachers under the supervision of one administrator, which would be the director of special education um, in all of our buildings spread out in multiple programs. I don't know that there will be enough time within the workday for these kind of programs to be um, nurtured and, and bringing our kids back to where they belong, which is as in our district as much as possible. So um, those are all problematic things. 
the, the truth is when I started here, we didn't have an assistant to the superintendent because he'd retired. We also didn't have the CPSC chair who was also called the director at the time because she did more than just CPSC chair work. Um, and we also had a CSC chair, but the two of the three had retired. We had four state ed complaints that were open. We have not had a state ed complaint in years that Mrs. Manzi hasn't taken care of before it got to the state education department. So she has saved us money. She has brought our kids back. The other thing that she was charged with doing because it was something that was uh, done in another district. And I said, I don't know why we can't do it here. Our, our special needs kids that are in our life skills class, which are our most, more, most disabled kids in, that we can house within the district, we're going to BOCES half day from ninth grade on. And Mrs. Manzi helped work with her staff to create a business program. And you guys have gotten some of those uh, presents from them, the, the, the painted uh, signs for the holidays and the like. They have opened a business where they, they sell uh, dog biscuits. And we actually keep them now in district full day in ninth and 10th grade, and we were looking to do that same thing in 11th to 12th grade, which decreases our expenditures out to BOCES and keeps our kids in house as much as possible. She also helped to start the basketball program last year, um, which helped support our kids and, and, and put them on, on, the, on the courts so that they could have a, a more well-rounded opportunity. So, and that's just, those are just some, some pretty big things that she's done and not even the smaller things that she's done, which is really, take our CSC process and make it much more streamlined so that the kids are, we're really looking at data to make sure that our kids are moving forward the way they need to move forward um, in order to be as successful as they can. Um, it, it, it's, it's again, not something that I would have advised. We were asked by the board, we were tasked by the board to look at staffing reductions, both administration to, across the board, administration, teaching, um, and we were tasked to say what would have the least impact. And we did give three administrative cuts for the board to consider. We gave about, about 15 teacher cuts for the board to consider, um, three or four custodian, a couple of clericals. We gave those cuts for the board consideration. We spent a significant amount of time as an administrative unit um, saying what would least impact our students moving forward. And that was even prior to COVID. So I, I, we're going to have very deep special education needs for our students coming back and um, to not have someone spearhead that it is, is going to be detrimental. Linda, let me ask you something. You, you say that it's detrimental to kids all this about other stuff. Wasn't it detrimental to tell children that, well, to tell the teachers that you were gonna cut 43 of them or 40 of them and then kids be, be able to find out and then they find out and they're crying in school and texting their parents at home and then showing up at board of ed meetings children who, who could be seniors who this could be this is like the year's terrible with the pandemic they've lost so much of their senior year and all the fun aspects of it and they're crying in our board of ed meeting on march 10th because you and reza told teachers or told the teachers union that we were going to get rid of how many people i mean if we're really being honest here you did give the guidance the director of guidance and now you're asking for him back but you you gave that as a cut only half time there i we said that half of that position could be could be abolished and that was something that we did because we looked at administrative cuts, which is what the board tasks us to do. So we never said that there were going to be 43 teacher cuts. What we said was that there could be with the decreased enrollment, bringing class sizes, moving up class sizes from the teens into the low twenties, mostly in the middle school and the high school. But Linda, what I'm saying to you is look at the anxiety we cause people. Look at the aggravation, upsetment we caused people that was completely unnecessary. So Jackie, I'm gonna stop you for a second because we were asked to look at enrollment numbers and we were asked to come up with legitimate, with cuts that would not hurt children. When you have class sizes of 15, 18, 16 at the middle school. So you, you, don't, think cut, you don't think cutting these people's, these kids teachers wasn't gonna be 
any sort of, wasn't going to hurt children. Hey, Lee, you tell me you're not for hurting children. I, 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 I told this you, conversation. if enrollment's down and you had to cut people, I totally understood. But at the same token, it started at the top. Now all yeah, of a sudden, and, and money fell out that. of the sky. Money fell out of the sky once the abolishments came. And now we want to go backwards. It just doesn't make sense. So Jack, yeah, I, you know, you keep saying money fell out of the sky. It was, uh, it was something that we found out that we could not get done this summer because of the COVID closure. It okay, is not that's, that that's 1.8. Linda, that's 1.8. We were down $3 million. That's 1.8. What I'm saying yeah. to you, and that's actually giving us an overture. That's giving us a surplus. So what I'm saying to you is, when you really do the math, where did $3 million come from? And why is it that this, this district hides things? Why is it you hide things from even the Board of Ed? I've only been here 10 months. And the things that I found out and the things I've seen are disgusting. I've been told that we can do without an administrator to then been told that we can't. Well, I listened to administration, Lee. I did what you told me to. So Jackie, when, when, when we went through this, this presentation with you folks, we were originally at 203,000 with our, our projected budget. We went line by line. We looked at retirements that didn't need to replace because the enrollment decreases and we got that down to 201 million. We then further looked at some other guidelines, including the, the budget guidelines, and once again looked at class sizes. And, you know, I, I have class sizes at Ronkonkwa Middle School of computer essentials at 12. Putting 24 kids in a computer class is not going to harm a child. So we looked very deeply at our current enrollment and what our class sizes were, and we said that it would, it, it would behoove us at this point to make the teaching staff in line with the enrollment, which is what part our budget guidelines said. We said that we could actually, if we did that as deeply as getting all the enrollments up to 24 in each one of our sections, it would be 40, 40 teachers, but we would never suggest cutting that deeply into-, into Lindsay, you, are, you would be for though, putting our two middle schools in one. And our two middle schools, it's just crazy. The, the, the ideas that you guys have come up with, some of them, they, they're not really feasible. Like putting our, LM, our, don't close an elementary school, but close a middle school. It's just a lot of crazy things I've heard since I've been on the board. I understand nobody wants to hurt anybody's livelihood, but positions had to be abolished. Things can always be revisited. But for now, I think you guys are just... I, I really. Well, I just brought it up for a consideration. Obviously, it doesn't sound like um, any movement in this conversation. Uh, does anybody else have anything to add to this? Uh, I do. How many? How many? You know. So, if if we don't have our assistant superintendent for special ed. Linda, you're saying you're advising the board to cut certain programs, which is going to end up letting teachers go? I mean, well, we have to do one of two things. We either have to pay someone to supervise those programs, or we have to abolish those programs because they are 12 month programs. What would it cost to bring someone in to look over those programs? I have no idea because I, I, I have in our director. Wait, like, shouldn't all decision. of this stuff? Shouldn't all of this stuff have been looked into before a board even would make a decision? I, I'm all talking, I'm talking, Jackie, please, please, please. Sorry, Lee. Um, you know, these are things you have to look into. Not one board member wants to cut a teacher. I don't even think there was one teacher even discussed it being cut. It, I thought it, I thought of making maybe humanities instead because we used to have humanities versus two, uh, two chairs that make one humanities, you save $150,000. That we used to do, that's more manageable, plus the class size has gone down, so that's manageable. But no one wants to consider that cut, cutting, cutting curriculum and cutting special ed. We have no one to go to after this. 
If we can't go to Dean, if we can't go, go to Monica at the dais, we have no one to go to when we're sitting there in discussions. We, our teachers, Dean is support to our teachers. He supports our teachers. He doesn't wanna cut teachers. He actually finds places for teachers to, to make a, a department better. So no one's trying to cut. The board is not trying to cut one over the other. Don't want to cut any program. Don't want to cut the kid or the pre-K program. I've been dealing with that program on and off as a on a chopping block for years. I asked it again this year. What would it be like to cut that program, the, the, the baby program? They're better off with us because if they don't, if we don't take care of them when they're babies, we might lose them and end up costing us more money. So for the $200,000 loss, it pays to keep that program because it might cost $500,000 in later years. I wouldn't want to lose that program, nor do I want to bring someone else in to maintain it. That it costs $100,000, 125 to pay somebody to maintain it. You know, so you know, when we have to put nickels and dimes and quarters together, we have to see what's in the best interest of the entire district. What's the best interest of kids? What's the best interest of the teachers? I personally think Dean works well with the teachers. Um, you know, uh, he brings in programs we've never had. Like you said, Jackie, you're new on the board. Um, I saw what has happened in the past six years. I really, I'm not saying this for any other thing and then it's true. Anything we've asked, our writing skills, are just phenomenal compared to where they used to be. The big talk was we can't write. Our kids can't write. Kids in other schools can't write. Our kids can write now. Our little babies coming out of kindergarten knows how to write a book. I watched it. I've been into the schools to see things like that. I don't know where the statistic will go without someone of that type of leadership helping our, our kids. It's helping our kids and helping our teachers become the best they can be. And believe me, they become pretty spectacular because of the scores that we're getting and the awards that get, are, they're get, we're getting shows what the teachers are doing with how they're performing in the classroom. But they're getting guidance from one person, that would be Dean. He goes out, he does the homework, he does the, I'm not, I, I'm saying this from the bottom of my heart. He goes out and does the homework and provides all the information the best he can to the teachers, the best way he can. He provides professional development where he can. We spend a lot of money on making our good teachers even better. And, and they're entitled to that because it's important. And let me tell you, a lot of the teachers do appreciate it. They do care and they become better at their trade because they've gotten that help. And he did it. You know, you asked him about STEM program. They did it. Things that we wanted, all that money that was saved all those years, you know, where'd that money come from? We had people in the past, all they did was save the money. We had no money for we had no money for robotic. For a little kid, for our little kids, they wouldn't give us money for robotics in middle school. Now we have great robotic teams. We have a class of robotics, not just uh, extra help. These are all things that you're just taking for granted, but these are all things I've seen the last six years build up. You're just assuming that's natural to you. I saw it, the buildup. Now, I, I'm not, this is not favoritism. This is not picking a teacher over administrator. There are other administrative cuts that can be made to save two important jobs. Neither one of these people are friends of mine. They're employees of the district that both do a good job. And, and, and I am afraid if they're like, if they if they go, we have no one to no one has anyone to go to the teachers, the union, me, you, no one. You can't sit at the dais and turn around and say, "Hey, Dean, I had heard blah blah blah. What are you going to do about it?" You're not going to have that benefit. You're not. And, and let me tell you, I don't know where we'll go. It'll take years to recover from this one. It really will. I can't support a budget that does this to, to teachers and, and uh, because everyone's going to get hurt at the end. Enough said for me. Okay, I guess uh, 
Moving on to public comment. Jesse, do you have the questions? Hi, yes, um, I do. Um, some of them you did touch on, but I had arranged them all beforehand. So I'm going to read them off as is. Um, so um, I did, I was asked by the board just to kind of surmise some of the emails. A lot of them were based on or questioning the same thing. So I just kind of put all the questions together. Um, so the first of regard the budget, uh, there were uh, a few emails concerning the budget for armed guards. Um, and one of the questions was if the budget fails, will armed guards be considered in a conting contingency budget? Uh, additionally, someone asked if it's possible to have the guard budget, the armed guard budget be a separate referendum. Okay. Um... Jackie, would you like to start to answer that question or somebody else or whatever? That should be the superintendent. Okay. I, uh, right. Well, I think we we decide what the contingency budget is, but if Linda can answer it, that's sure. Uh, yeah, the board decides what the contingency budget is, so you're going to have to answer that because that, that, that would not be something that would be a decision I would make. That would be a board decision. Okay, so then the answer to that question is it could be it could not be we don't know we don't have a contingency budget right now so we don't know i mean i don't know what i would put in or take out at that point that'd be some more hard decisions we'd have to make that's my yeah. answer i don't know what anybody else would say uh i don't we have to make a contingency budget to show the community the same time that we're asking for a budget i mean we've always done that in the past this is how it would look if the budget goes through this is how it looks the budget doesn't go through that's a normal part of the normal process. oh you're right lee you're right, I forgot about that. Um, we haven't gotten that far yet, so I don't know what I would do. I don't know what Lee, Mylin, or Jackie or Mark would do, but I'll speak for myself. I don't know what I would do at this point. I had decision has to be made before a budget goes out because a contingency budget has to be made up. Actually, you would make a contingency budget if the budget fails, so you don't have to do it right away, but that is something you can consider as part of the contingency budget. And then- right. Well, always in the past, in the, in, the, in the budget brochures, we show the budget if it passes, the budget if it fails. Uh, I mean, the contingency budget. Yeah, but is that budget. the contingency budget? You're, you're right, Lee, I remember that. But is that the contingency budget, or is that just what happens if it fails, what kind of things that we have to make cuts for? I don't think it actually said what the cuts were, right? Get a it just list goes of categories? All the cuts that had to be made. Right, OK, from the categories, though. So you have a couple different options Thanks, if Frederick. the voters reject a school budget. The first um, option would be to submit the same budget for a second vote. The second option is to submit the revised budget for a second vote. Or third is to adopt a contingency budget. A contingent budget is just ordinary contingent expenses. So it would be expenditures necessary to operate the regular instructional program while preserving the health and safety of students and staff and protecting the district's property. So your tax levy would remain flat, but some expenditures are prohibited. So equipment purchase is not related to health and safety and new capital projects. Does that include sports or anything like that? <clears throat> uh, Interscholastic athletic club sports that uh, those all fall outside the instructional program, but um, you don't need to necessarily eliminate them. So, uh, okay, so that's definitely, uh, my personal opinion, we haven't failed a budget as long as I, I'm i aware. Um, if the budget fails, I'm gonna probably point in a direction that it failed because of uh, armed guards being in there. So I would, what, what I would probably do, um, is if we had to put it up for a second vote, I would put it up um, before it goes through it to a contingency, like Bridget had mentioned. I put up for the second vote and remove the armed guards. But that would that would be something I would do. <clears throat> Jackie, until we have to do a contingency budget, like Eileen, I would honestly not know what I would want to do because I also do not know what we're gonna be in store for us in, in September. We have no idea. All I know is that with the additional, and there has been additional 
firearm issues, gun-related arrests in Bohemia and in our district in the last two months, I would, I would have to see where we're at. I would have to look at all the numbers and decide what I would, what I would be for and or against. And, I, and that would go for not just armed guards, it would go for a few different things. Lee? Well, I think we're going to hear the post of the community after this meeting. Uh, probably it'll be all over Facebook, so maybe I should make an effort to go on and start reading some of it. And get the post, you know, the post of the community to see if they're angry, if they're not angry. Um, uh, and before I make any decision on anything, but at, at, I cannot see spending money at that point if, if the community voted the budget down. I'm not happy with right now the way things are, and it has nothing to do with the guns. It has nothing to do with armed guards. It has to do with the educational part of the, of the district. Uh, you know, you think I'm not for moving up, and I get accused of this. And I mentioned, I mentioned about a college, uh, their graduation. I told, I, all I said in the email was college graduation. They didn't have a graduation. So what the university did was promise the kids they'll find them a job. That was their graduation present. I made that comment. It wasn't because I was degrading anyone or, and moving up or degrading this. But you know what? People aren't going to vote for a budget that's not educationally sound. I don't want to vote for it. It's not educationally sound. It hurts kids. It doesn't Mark. help teachers, and it doesn't help administration, and it doesn't help the Board of Education. This budget hurts kids and teachers. It doesn't help either one. Forget guns. Put guns to the side. Guns have nothing to do with this. This budget hurts kids. Mark? I'm going to disagree with that because um, I think we're tightening up this budget so that we can make sure that we have the mental health people that are in there that will be right there with the kids to hire more of them because we're going to have a lot more kids. So I think you're wrong on that point, Lee, but I'll agree to disagree with you. I know what you're trying to say. And um, I'm, it's not a few cuts here and there. It's not going to impact as much as 40 teachers would have impacted kids. So well, I'm going to agree to disagree. Not going. I, you're, using, you're just randomly using that figure. It's very insincere. That was the list was 43, so I'm actually underestimating. You're but that's okay. being insincere. I'm, I'm, I'm done talking to you, Lee. No, but Lee, go back being serious for I, a minute. I'm not go arguing with you, Go back and watch guys. the March 10th. No, but listen to me for a minute. Go back and watch the March 10th um, meeting. Really, go back and watch it. It's not like we're making this up. It's, it's there. I heard that number is the same way you heard the number. Okay, I was so taken back did. by that number, but I understood what she was saying. She wasn't saying cut. She's saying our numbers are going down. We can't potentially cut 43. I didn't even like it when they raised kindergarten class sizes. So you're talking to the wrong person. I didn't like it. I liked when our number was 17 at one point. Dr. Grobman. Lee, you're saying Lee. that now. You're saying no, that said now. It. But it's I wait, wait, but let me let me talk. But but you actually said to me in the past. When I said, I like 17, 18, 19. That's what I like. 18, 19 is perfect. I like the 16 to 19 numbers. I, I It used to be especially. 17. And you said to me that kids, they've had 30 in a class and 35. That was you. So Not I get me. it. You might be never. low class sizes, but never. you are. And I never you, said kids have. Yeah, in other yes. districts, never yes. connect for it. No, you said that, Lee. Lee, you also said that you wanted to cut the music program for the third graders. That's, I mean, I wouldn't cut a program for kids that we have now. I don't want to do that. So let's just agree to disagree. You have your ideas. You know how the I program, have my ideas. You know how Everybody, the program, I found out. We all want for kids. You're making it sound like only you want what's best for kids. That's just not true. That's I just not asked true. about you, that. You go about things differently than I do. I, I speak my mind and that's it. I'm not going to go around sideline and I'm not going to just agree with admin all the time. You always say, listen to admin, listen to admin. I can't do that, Lee. I'm not you. So why can't you just be an adult and agree to disagree? And I'm not yelling, Lee. I'm tired. I want to go to bed. But I'm just saying, I'm done with all this. Just agree to disagree and move on. Why do you have to beat a dead horse all the time to try to 
change people's minds and make make the rest of the community mad at this one to divide and conquer. I, we only, all want am, am I the only kids. one? We just do it in different ways. I want to I want to add more mental health people in. I want to make sure that we're top heavy down. You want to make sure that um, that there's uh, directors to go to and, and superintendents. You do things your way. That's why there's five people on the board, Lee, because we all come with different experience. So if you could understand that, then maybe you, sh- you could have been a good mentor. But when you go at people, like the way you go at people, it- it's not helping any kid. and It's not helping us. So just move on. Is all I'm saying. I don't, want to, I don't want to argue with you anymore. I'm done with it. It's, it's like talking to a brick wall at this point. All You're right, not going to change my mind. I'm not going to change yours. I get it. Do you get it? So let's move on. All right, Mark. The question was asked, would you put it in the contingency? What would you do, Mark? Well, first of all, I'm hoping that we're making a budget that's going to pass. So I'm hoping that it's going to pass. And I can't answer a hypothetical question. I'd have to first hear from the community after it didn't pass. If it didn't pass, I'd go around, listen to the community, and then get some ideas. I'm not going to make an answer because I'm not. Uh, it's not up to me to make the answer. It's up to my community. And that's what I'm going to listen to. Okay, uh, Jesse, next question. Okay, they did mention, they did ask too if um, it could be considered a separate referendum for the budget vote. We were advised by a legal to incorporate it into the budget. Okay. Um, then another I budget question. I do that though, so I, I just want to make sure that's, I thought we should listen to the people. That's why I always say we should listen to the people. But I understand I got outvoted and it was okay. I moved on. I, I, I went along with you, Mark, on that particular vote. And I think, Mylon, you went along also. So three of us did say that it could go on a referendum. And then they, then no, that, they you changed your mind. I didn't, it wasn't me. No, I, I changed my mind. I originally wanted it on the budget. And so did Lee change your mind. That was the day when some things happened. I was like, this is crazy. But uh, we try to change each other's votes way too much here. And you know what? I've been on the board now almost two years. Every time I disagreed with something from the beginning, it seemed like it was a nightmare after. I've had people come to my, just things that should happen. Let us be who we are, make our opinion and move forward. It just never happens that way. It's really disheartening. I don't know why we can't move on and respect each other's decisions. Okay, so uh, the next question, uh, I believe he's, this is referencing elementary. Um, uh, it was a question about eliminating math specialists when there are many more elementary reading specialists. There wasn't a lot of reference, so. At this point, there's been no eliminations of any teachers in the budget. Okay. Um, there was a question as well that was submitted just uh, requesting that the board revisit abolishing the two assistant superintendent positions. Um, we, we have that discussion. Then there was uh, someone also asked regarding the budget if the district has looked into cutting every line item, if allowed by one to 2% to close the gap. Bridget, that would be a question for you. There's no more gap at this point, And we have been going line by line. If we have a significant state aid decrease, we will certainly be going line by line again at the end of next week. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna move on to distance learning now. Uh, There were several questions around um, video instruction, live video instruction, and if the district has any plans to start this type of instruction. When did that question would, I guess, go to you? So as we were advised, the live video instruction is a change in working condition that needs to be mandatorily bargained, and we are in discussions. at this point, there's there's been no um, no agreement. Thank you. Um, there was also someone specifically asked why speech therapy isn't being offered on a one to one sort of option. Same que- same answer. Uh, our speech therapists are members of the teachers union, and um, 
that there's been no agreement. Okay, and then the, the final uh, four questions kind of surround end of year things. Um, one of them is, is there a plan for students to retrieve their personal belongings from district buildings? So we are opening up our buildings next week for our teachers to come in and begin to close up their rooms. Um, once all the teachers' materials are removed, we will put a plan in place for parents to come and clean out student lockers, as well as retrieve any materials left in classrooms. Probably um, not, probably the week after or the week before Memorial Day, somewhere in that ballpark, but teachers will be coming in first and then students after that. There was a question regarding uh, payments that parents had made for various school events, um, like field trips. Is there a plan to reimburse those funds? I'm gonna let Bridget answer that question. Uh, that was a question that was brought up today in our administrative cabinet council meeting. Um, and I'm gonna allow her to answer that. So we are first waiting to receive reimbursement checks from all of the vendors and companies. That is obviously the only way that we can start to reimburse parents. After that, for every single person that needs a reimbursement, we would have to essentially create hundreds upon hundreds of vendors per person to be able to issue a check to them directly. So Envision, our financial software, has created a program for us and sent us an Excel file so that we can fill out the information, the name, the address, and the dollar amount, and send it back to Envision for them to convert it into the program. This, will, this way, once we receive the reimbursement checks from the companies, we can go ahead and issue the reimbursement to the individual themselves. So it's a, it's a um, it's in the works. It's just a, I'd say a couple more weeks before um, we can turn that around. There was uh, also the last question, just what is the plan for finals for high school students? Dean, since you're leading that committee in that discussion with administration and teachers, can you give us an answer to that? Uh, we will be coming out with a, a document for our parents within the next couple of days regarding fourth quarter grading, final averages at the secondary level, as well as final exams at the secondary level. So prior to me releasing this community, I just want to make sure that all our instructional staff is aware. Thank you. That um, from the emails that I shared with the board that were received, that's the, the general consensus of the questions that were posed. Oh, thank you, Jesse. Okay, so we're moving on to Sorry, I had all my papers mixed in. Okay, um, we're moving on to recommended action, personal matters, schedule one. I need a motion and a second. Eileen motions. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Lee? Aye, I said aye. Okay, uh, moving on to schedule one abolish uh, uh, why is that on there again wait let's make a motion to discuss it i guess and then we'll yeah well that, that's can we pull can we pull one it's h1b for a separate vote where's that one that's the one we just did jackie okay I had said it earlier in executive. I didn't know if you guys heard me when I said it then. But you did. I, I, and I said I got to say it again in public. Well, since we all voted and it passed, we can. you can ask for reconsideration to re-vote, and you need two more votes to do this. Yeah, not, you, you guys are all a go, so I understand. It's fine. Okay. Sorry about that, Jackie. I meant to... I meant to uh, <laughs> So you're asking me why the abolishment is on here again, 
and that was a mistake that was made while I was in the middle of an, a COVID infection in the last board meeting. Uh, our legal counsel said, make sure that that title is the correct title um, on the website, which is where I went for the information. The title was incorrect. Um, okay, I know that so the board I, Linda, uh, just I'm, so you know, <laughs> I originally said that the title that you have there tonight, you corrected me and made Jesse change it. Um, because you said it wasn't the correct title then. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm explaining that. I would just like okay. to continue to I explain I just that. want to point that out, that, that we did have the correct title. So I don't understand if it's just semantics, why we can't just change the minutes. That's all I'm asking. Uh, because and that's it's probably not to semantics. Lisa, not you. Okay. Uh, Lisa? Yes. Hi. You want to, you want to make sure that you um, have abolished the correct position. Because you need right, to so that's what I'm saying, Lisa. I did say that title. I did say it, and then Linda corrected right. um, right. Jesse right. after after it went through. She said it was the right. wrong title. So we had already voted on the correct title, and then the new title that was on the website was put in to Jesse after the vote. So that's why that's I don't understand true. why it's on there again. You were actually vote. You actually voted on the amended one, which was which was my taking a picture of the website and sending it to Jesse. You did not vote on the original. The original title. I'll go back and listen to the meeting, but I was pretty sure that we did that. And then, then you said, wait, 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 that's not the title. So you shouldn't but sure I, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I just wanted to know why it was on there again, because I know we did it the right way first and then it was corrected. So I, I was just curious. But we did, we did say special ed. We can go back and watch it. We did say special ed and then you correct us and said spe uh, special services. So you, you just want to be sure you're correct because you you want it if you want to abolish the position, it has to be the correct position so that um, there's no confusion. Because right now, the position you, abol you abolish doesn't exist. You abolish the position that doesn't exist. What position, what position are they abolishing now? The uh, assistant superintendent for special education. It's the same one we already abolished. It's just. It was the wrong title, apparently. Okay. Um, Lisa, I, I'm going to definitely go back and look at that meeting, but I mean, we can vote on it again now. I'm not changing my vote anyway, it doesn't matter. So, are we done? All right, so, so I we took have the to, motion. We have to motion and vote. Okay, so uh, I'll make the motion. I'll second. All right, I'm going to say no. Say no. Yes. Yes. Mark. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's move on to. Are we done? I... No, there's a schedule two. Oh, oh I thought I thought we just did schedule two. No, you did. You did schedule one abolition of uh, abolishment of position. Uh, you need to do schedule two, schedule three, uh, appointments, tenure, salary changes. Why am I not seeing this on here? It's okay. on there, my Linda. There's people on there. Oh, all right. Well, so, so we're go just remind right. me, Jesse, to ask you about the minutes before we end this meeting. Okay, so we're going to schedule two. I need a motion and a second. Motion. I'll second that. Uh, all in favor? Aye. And then there's, uh, we have the regular, then we're moving into consent agenda, right, Linda? Yes, and um, I, I, I think you wanted to table. Number two? Number two. Okay, so we have items. We have items one, two, three, and four, and we have to table number two. Um, I don't see number two. I, I don't. I know we're tabling it. I know what it is, but on the minutes I see one, and then three is a surplus item, and then budget transfers, which I didn't see because they were they weren't uh, PDF, but they are now. So I don't know but if Jesse that one off already. No, Maybe. if you um, if you depend if you're looking at it printed the number two is listed at the bottom of the previous page so i think you might not just be seeing that oh, oh okay i'm That's looking at it on the computer looks. 
Oh. Yeah, I mean, it should. No, it's here. Be there. It's on the line. Yeah. It's online. All right. I mean, I know what it is, so it's not a problem. I just, I just didn't see it. I was, it was just weird. It goes from one to three on mine. Very strange. Oh no, there it is. It is the bottom of the page. I see it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we're tabling number two. So right. we need to vote on one, three, four. So um, I just a have a question. Okay. We have our uh, motion is, on the table. What is a six inch, the six inch jointer? What is that? I'm just, it's a curiosity thing. What is that surplus item? I'm okay with it. I just want to know what it is. Anybody? I, I believe it was used originally in the technology program. Correct. No, it's, used for, wood, it's used for it's used for woodworking. Cool that was, yeah. Or what it what it was. Okay. So do we have an all in favor? Aye. Aye. Lee. Aye, Jackie. Jackie, aye. Lee. Yes. Mark? Aye. Aye. Okay, so I believe we're moving into executive session. So I need a motion and second to adjourn this meeting and then a motion and second to move. No, Mylin, we could put the there's only one item left to their executive session. We could put that on for next next um the next time. But before we end that I wanna just ask Jesse a question. And she may not know this answer. She may have to ask Mary Jane, I'm not really sure. We used to put after we did the um, transfers, maybe Linda, you know this. I mean, not transfers. Uh, personnel, after they were approved or not approved, it used to go on the minutes. And I, forget, I don't know when it stopped happening, but it's not because uh, I don't have to look at those minutes anymore, so I see them. But uh, a couple of parents in the community told me that it's not on the minutes anymore. I I'm not sure, but I can I will look into it i'll reach out to mary jane kind of see what yeah only on. after yeah after it's approved and i don't think i don't know if mary jane did it either but after it's approved if you go back like a couple of years you'll see after it was approved you know on this on the tenure you know the schedules for um hirings firings or whatever that is it used to show up after the meeting and now hi. it's not there it's mary jane hello hi mary jane hi um yeah, what I uh, usually do is go to the agenda and I um, copy it from the agenda, um, Jesse, and then I paste it into the minutes. Okay. So I don't know that I advised uh, Jesse of that. So okay. we'll look, we, All can, right, we can look We can look at it to, tomorrow. All right, no problem. I just wanted to make sure that it goes on there for the, for the public. And then, um, like I said, Mylin, for the executive session part, we could do that at the next meeting. We just have one item left that I brought in, right? Yes. Oh, okay. okay, so yeah. it's nothing, there's nothing pending then. No, but Jesse, can you please remind me to put that on the next meeting executive session? Yes. Thank you. All right, so I need a motion and a second to adjourn this meeting. I will definitely motion for that. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good night, everyone. Good night. Have a good night.